สวัสดีทุกคนสวัสดีทุกคนนะครับตอนนี้เราอยู่ในซูมแชทของคณะดุเรียนศาสตร์ศิลปกรนะครับแล้วก็ถ่ายทอดสดไปทาง Facebook b r o a d c a s t ด้วยตอนนี้ในบ r o a d c a s t Facebook เนี่ยจะเห็นเฉพาะหน้าจอคือมีผมอาจารย์ชนุเตียชัทนันนะครับแล้วก็อาจารย์น้องนลินนะครับสองคนครับนลินเพชรอินผมผมจากสาขาแจ๊สนะครับแล้วก็ของอาจารย์น้องเนี่ยจากสาขาธุรกิจดนตรีและบันเทิงจริงจริงวันนี้เป็นงานที่เราเรียกว่าเป็นศิลปรกรอาเขต2021ใช่ไหมครับจ้าน้องซึ่งเป็นงานเป็นใครเป็นเป็นโปรเจกต์ของจริงๆแล้วเป็นของคณะมัทนาศิลป์ซึ่งซึ่งจะเป็นการรวมเอาเรื่องของทั้งอาร์ตทั้งคราฟทั้งดีไซน์ต่างๆแล้วก็ดนตรีก็เป็นส่วนหนึ่งของงานอาเขตในวันนี้แล้วก็ตัวงานในวันนี้เนี่ยเป็นกิจกรรมแรกของ13กิจกรรมที่จะเกิดขึ้นภายในช่วงตั้งแต่เดือนกันยาจนถึงเดือนตุลาของปีนี้นะครับวันนี้เป็นกิจกรรมแรกเลยก็ก่อนอื่นก็ต้องขอทักทายน้องๆทุกคนนักศึกษาศิลปรกรนะครับแล้วก็ที่ผู้ชมที่ดูอยู่ทาง Facebook ของทางคณะเรียนศาสตร์จริงๆวันนี้เราจะเป็นเรื่องของการพูดคุยโดยวิทยากรที่เราได้รับเกียรติมาจากาทางสิงคโปร์นะครับวิทยากรชื่อเจอร์มี่มอนเทโรซึ่งเขาเป็นเรียกว่าศิลปินที่เรียกว่าเก่งหลายด้านเลยไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องของการเล่นเองนะครับแล้วก็เรื่องของที่เป็นมิวบิลมิวสิกบิสเนสก็เรื่องของธุรกิจอะไรดนตรีด้วยใช่ไหมครับจันน้องซึ่งซึ่งเป็นอะไรที่น่าจะตอบโจทย์ครบวงจรวงจรในเรื่องของการเล่นสมัยนี้ว่าเราเก่งอย่างเดียวไม่พอแล้วเราเราจะต้องมีวิธีในการโปรโมทตัวเองวิธีในการที่จะสร้างอีเวนต์สร้างธุรกิจของตัวเองโดยใช้ดนตรีเป็นสื่อนําใช่ไหมครับจันน้องครับใช่ค่ะก็ถือว่าเป็นโอกาสดีมากๆนะคะเพราะว่าอย่างที่เราทราบว่าตอนนี้เรามีพันธมิตรทั่วโลกนะคะในมุมมองของพวกเราเนี่ยเราก็จะรู้สถานการณ์ของบ้านเราดีว่าเกิดอะไรขึ้นบ้างกับธุรกิจดนตรีและบันเทิงในบ้านเรานะคะแต่ว่าบางครั้งเราก็อยากทราบว่าต่างประเทศเนี่ยเขาเขามีมีมีเอฟเฟกอะไรหรือว่าเกิดอะไรขึ้นกับเขาบ้างแล้วเขามีวิธีปรับตัวหรือว่ารับมือกับกับกับสิ่งพวกนี้ยังไงเผื่อว่าจะเป็นไอเดียให้เรานำมาปรับใช้หรือบางทีอาจจะเป็นช่องปัญหาที่เราเห็นว่าอ,อ,อาจจะมีทางแก้ได้หรือว่าได้ไอเดียอะไรเกี่ยวกับการเข้าฟังครั้งนี้นะคะเพราะว่าอ,อย่างที่ทราบว่าตอนแรกอพอทราบว่าเจอร์มี่มาก็นึกว่าจะเป็นเรื่องเพอร์ฟอร์มเพราะว่าเขาเขาเป็นนักดนตรีใช่ไหมคะแต่พอ,อทางอาเขตแจ้งมาว่าโอเคเราจะพูดคุยกันในแง่มุมของธุรกิจก็ก็ก็ดีใจมากนะคะที่มีแนวทางนี้มาให้เด็กบิสเนสได้ฟังกันว่าบ้านอื่นเมืองอื่นเขาเขาปรับตัวกับสิ่งเหล่านี้ยังไงแล้วก็วิธีการที่ตัวนักดนตรีเองมาพูดเนี่ยค่ะมันก็จะยิ่งยิ่งเสริมเนาะยิ่งเสริมว่าว่าเด็กที่เป็นนักดนตรีเนี่ยเราจะเอาตัวรอดในธุรกิจดนตรีพวกนี้ได้ยังไงค่ะครับซึ่งจริงๆกําหนดการของการอบรมออนไลน์ในวันนี้นะครับเรียกว่าเลคเชอร์ออนไลน์ก็ได้จริงๆแล้วก็จะเป็นในในส่วนของการที่ทางคุณเจเรมี่เขาก็จะมาพูดบรรยายเกี่ยวกับเรื่องของสิ่งที่เขาทำอยู่อาจจะเป็นชั่วโมงหรือว่าชั่วโมงประมาณ90นาทีแรกแล้วก็จะเปิดโอกาสให้ตอนนี้น้องๆทั้งประมาณ15คนตอนนี้ที่อยู่ในซูมแล้วก็ผู้ชมที่ชมผ่านทาง Facebook Live ของทางคณะดุเรียนศาสตร์เนี่ยได้ถามคําถามเข้ามาส่วนน้องๆที่อยู่ในซูมก็สามารถที่จะถามคําถามด้วยโดยการที่จะเปิดใหม่อะไรเพิ่มขึ้นมาได้เลยหลังจากที่มีช่วง Q&A ใช่ไหมครับแต่สําหรับผู้ชมที่ชมอยู่ทาง Facebook เนี่ยสามารถพิมพ์คอมเมนต์ใต้คอมเมนต์ในตัวตัวไลฟ์ได้เลยเราจะมีทางทางคนที่มอนิเตอร์เนี่ยคอยป้อนคําถามกับให้ผมแล้วก็ทางอาจารย์นลินลองถามในในในในซูมแชทนี้อยู่นะครับก่อนอื่นก่อนที่เราจะเริ่มเนี่ยครับเดี๋ยวขอ,อเหมือนว่า
พูดเบื้องต้นในเรื่องของประวัติของคุณเจอร์มีก่อนจริงๆแล้วคุณเจอร์มีเนี่ยเป็นนักดนตรีที่เรียกว่าท่านนายวงการดนตรีแจ๊สเนี่ยไม่มีใครไม่รู้จักนะครับเพราะเรียกว่าเป็นศิลปินแจ๊สคนในคนแรกๆของซาวด์อีสเอเชียที่เหมือนว่าสร้างชื่อในภูมิภาคเป็นใน,ในระดับโลกนะครับแล้วก็เรียกว่าเป็นคนในสิงคโปร์เองก็จะเรียกว่าเป็นเป็นสิงคโปร์ king of swing ใช่ไหมครับเหมือนเป็นบิดาของของของวงการแจ๊สในในสิงคโปร์นะครับแล้วก็เคยเล่นกับเรียกว่านักดนตรีที่เป็นระดับโลกหลายๆท่านไม่ว่าจะเป็นเจมส์มูดี้นะครับน้องๆที่เรียนแจ๊สน่าจะรู้จักเบนนี่โกลสันไมเคิลเบรกเกอร์บ๊อบบี้บ๊อบบี้แม็กฟาร์เรนใช่ไหมครับแรนดี้เบรกเกอร์ลิลิตนาวอะไรเงี้ยครับทุกเขาเล่นมาหมดแล้วทุกอย่างเออร์นี่วัตส์ใช่ไหมครับชาลีเฮเดนทุกๆอย่างเนี่ยแล้วก็มีโปรเจกต์ค่อนข้างเยอะเขาเหมือนว่ามีอัลบั้มทั้งเป็นเรื่องของโซโล่ของตัวเองแล้วก็เป็นอัลบั้มที่เป็นไซต์แมนให้คนอื่นเยอะสิบกว่าอัลบั้มที่ออกมานะครับแล้วก็นอกจากเรื่องของการอ,ออกผลงานเพลงต่างๆหรือว่าการแสดงดนตรีต่างๆเนี่ยเขายังเ,เมื่อเดือนสิงหาที่ผ่านมาวันที่9นะครับทางคุณเจอร์มี่เองเนี่ยก็ยังได้เรียกว่าเป็นเ,เป็นเรียกว่าวันชาติสิงคโปร์ใช่ไหมครับสิงคโปร์ National Day เนี่ยก็ยังสะยังได้รางวัลที่เป็น National Day Honor Award นะครับก็เรียกว่าเป็นอะไรที่เป็นรางวัลสูงสุดของของวันประจําชาติที่มอบให้กับศิลปินของของของคนสิงคโปร์นะครับแล้วก็เ,เรื่องของไอตัวผลงานล่าสุดของคุณเจอร์มี่ก็ยังมีเรื่องของอัลบั้มนะครับที่เล่น l i f e at No Black t i e นะครับที่ประเทศมาเลเซียนะครับกับมือเบสเจแอนเดอร์สันมือเบสระดับโลกนะครับทุกคนน่าจะรู้จักแล้วก็มือกลองที่ผมชื่นชอบเป็นการส่วนตัวเหมือนกันก็คือลูอิสแนชนะครับซึ่งเป็นอัลบั้มแรกในเซาท์อีสเอเชียเลยก็ได้ที่ไปติดท็อปทนะครับท็อปยีของ US แจ๊สชาร์ตนะครับแจ๊สวีคซึ่งเป็นชาร์ตที่เรียกว่าเหมือนเป็นเป็นบิลบอร์ดของของที่นู่นเลยซึ่งเป็นอะไรที่ถือว่าเป็นอะไรที่สําคัญมากที่เป็นนักดนตรีชาวเอเชียชาวเอเชียตะวันออกนะครับเฉียงใต้เนี่ยที่เป็นคนแรกที่ไปไปสร้างเรื่องของไอตัวตัวการติดโผในบิลบอร์ดของเขานะครับแล้วก็ทางคุณเจอร์มี่เองเนี่ยก็จะยังมาพูดถึงเรื่องของงานที่เขาสร้างสําหรับชุมชนไม่ว่าจะเป็นในส่วนของที่จะเป็นเรื่องขององค์กรที่เกี่ยวเรียกว่า Compass นะครับที่เป็น Composers o t h o r Societies of Singapore Limited นะครับแล้วก็ในส่วนของในเรื่องของ Jazz Association ที่เป็นเกี่ยวกับ Big Band เป็นเรื่องของการสร้างชุมชนดนตรีในในสิงคโปร์เองซึ่งซึ่งเป็นอะไรที่เป็นอะไรเยอะมากๆที่คุณเจอร์มี่เขาทำแต่ก่อนอื่นก่อนที่เราจะเริ่มกันครับอาจารย์น้องเดี๋ยวเรามาฟังอินโทรนิดหนึ่งเพลงนะครับเอฟครับเดี๋ยวจะให้น้องๆที่อยู่ในซูมแล้วก็คนที่ชมใน Facebook Live เนี่ยได้เราจะเปิดกันด้วยเป็นวิดีโอที่ที่คุณเจอร์มี่เล่นกับผลงานล่าสุดที่โนแบล็กไทยที่ประเทศมาเลเซียนะครับกับเจแอนเดอร์สันแล้วก็ลูอิสแนชครับเดี๋ยวเราฟังฟังเพลงกันก่อน
โอเคครับอ่าอันนั้นถือว่าเป็นเป็นเป็นอะไรที่เราจะได้รู้ว่าจูเรมี่เล่นเป็นยังไงนะครับแล้วก็จะน้องครับเราถึงเวลาแล้วครับตอนนี้เดี๋ยวเราแนะนำอาจารย์เจอร์มี่กันดีกว่าครับก็อันนี้เราจะเราจะเจอร์มี่ชอบพูดคุยเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะครับก็ถ้ามีคําถามอะไรในช่วงหลังก็สามารถถามแท้ๆเป็นภาษาอังกฤษแล้วก็ภาษาไทยด้วยนะครับ Now I like to introduce everyone to meet uh, Mr. Jeremy Montero. Jeremy, welcome to um, you know this online lecture. Thanks for being here. Um, you are mute, Jeremy. สวัสดีครับ Nice to be here, everybody. Great to see you. สวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับ Hi, Jeremy. We have about 20 people here on Zoom, and I think about 30 people watching on Facebook Live. Nice. So thanks again for for being here and thanks for doing this for us uh, Silicon student and for other watching out there. Thank you. So shall so, we get started? <laughs> sure. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's my second time that I have the pleasure of uh, speaking to students of uh, Silicon. Uh, the first time was a master class workshop for, with the musicians, and uh, and this time it's nice to just to kind of a informal. A guest uh, lecture talk uh, about the craft, um, the, the the art, and the business of music. But before I get started, maybe a, a short a biography of uh, of my my work as a musician. Uh, I have been doing this for forty five years now uh, professionally. I started off uh, in in nineteen seventy six. I was very lucky uh, when my when my mom actually was a uh, A private nurse uh, was looking after the owner of a jazz club in Singapore, the Club 392, and uh, she told the owner that I was a musician, that I was a jazz musician, that I, I believe finishing school soon and was looking for work as a jazz pianist. So he said, "Okay, when I'm when when I'm better, I will ask uh, ask Jeremy to come down for audition." And I went down for an audition. I was 16 years old at the time, and uh, I was very blessed not only to get the job. As the pianist for the band, but also as band leader, <laughs> at the age of 16, I had musicians in uh, 30 uh, in their 30s and 40s, and most of them were very very nice to me. Uh, you know because they were, it was about the music, but maybe one or two were not very happy that, that this 16 year old boy was uh, their boss. Uh, so there was uh, some difficulty, but in the end, it all worked out, and uh, 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 I had a wonderful time there. Worked with such Great musicians in Singapore. Uh, someone called Raim Hamid, who's known as the Nat King Cole of Singapore. He not only sounded like Nat King Cole at the time, but he also looked like Nat King Cole. So for me, it's like almost like a fantasy uh, of playing with Nat King Cole, even though I didn't have a chance to play with Nat King Cole. Um, I after that, I um, in the next year, I was very uh, fortunate to be invited to. Uh, by EMI Records to come and play some session piano and ended up being the in-house session pianist at EMI Records in Singapore when I was uh, not yet 17, but uh, it was such an honor to play with many of the big stars uh, around the region, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, especially, and uh, in uh, Malay music, Chinese music, and English pop music. And over the next uh, 15 years, I played on more than 300 pop albums. So although I have uh, 45 jazz albums, I've actually played on more than 300 uh, pop albums, uh, which I really, really enjoyed as well. Uh, uh, then when I turned 18 in Singapore, all of us have to go to the army. Uh, and, and for us, it's everyone goes, you know, it's not the red string and the black string. As in some go, some don't go. But in Singapore, everyone goes uh, uh, to the army at the age of 18 years old. And... Uh, uh, I was supposed to go straight from my combat military training, the initial training, into the music and drama company as a musician. Music and drama company is a company of uh, singers, dancers, and musicians. Uh, we had a big band by, at a time, uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, they couldn't find my file. So they look at my name Montero, and my my the name Montero at the time is a very famous medical name. A lot of famous doctors and nurses. So they said, okay, you go to the school of military medicine. So I went there and I uh, studied to be a combat medical orderly. Uh, uh, and uh, after three months, uh, I I passed out. Uh, I mean, not only just passed out and fainted on the parade square, but also passed out as a medic and. Uh, 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 had my Geneva Convention card, which which allowed me to put a cross on my helmet, and the cross is of course uh, X marks the spot for the enemy, you know, and uh, uh, so that was uh, 
good training. I, I really uh, appreciated learning uh, pharmacology and uh, also uh, first aid and all those kind of things. Um, after that, I was sent to be a medic in an infantry unit. But after one week, they found my file. <laughs> and so they said, oh, sorry, you're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be in music and drama company. And, and so I was very happy. But I was so proud of my uh, medic um, badge that I, I wore my magic, ma medic badge instead of change to the musician's badge for uh, around six months. <laughs> so uh, I went over to the music and drama company and I learned a lot there. And one thing I learned to do is to write big band arrangements uh, it, uh, and and I learned very fast because uh, my commanding officer uh, in the music and drama company, if I made more than two or three mistakes on the big band chart, he would he would give me guard duty, which meant that on Saturday and Sunday I couldn't go and see my girlfriend. So I I, I very fast I stopped making mistakes and the arrangements start to become perfect, <laughs> so that I could have my weekends. Uh, uh, after I left the army, I stayed there for three and a half years. So normally it's only two years or two and a half years, but I actually signed on for an extra year because I was enjoying myself so much. And uh, I, I went on to, to work with some great local musicians like Luis Soliano, who's a quite legendary drummer. Uh, uh, he's also uh, what you call a national artist or national musician uh, in Singapore. And, and, and uh, uh, he also worked for many years, uh, seven or eight years in the 60s in, in Thailand, in Bangkok. So, uh, so he was based in Bangkok. So I got a chance to be in his band and just continued my career uh, as a musician. In 1988, I was very lucky, just by coincidence, that the founder of the Montreal Jazz Festival had dinner at a restaurant in Singapore, and they were playing my album uh, on the, mu the background music, and he asked, who is this pianist? And so the owner said, oh, it's a Singaporean pianist. And um, so he said, wow, you know, ask him to contact me, and I will put him on the main stage of the Montreal Jazz Festival. So in 1988, I had a chance to play on the same show as uh, on the night of the 16th, I'll never forget, 16th of July, 1988, uh, with uh, Chip Perea, the Yellow Jackets, uh, Mongo Santa Maria, uh, Courtney Pine, and uh, many other uh, wonderful musicians who were on uh, that night. It was, un it was a very surreal for me. I, I, I still sometimes can't imagine. Uh, the video of the whole concert is beautifully shot by, the, by a subsidiary of the BBC, 11 cameras and it's available on YouTube if you are interested to watch the whole concert. So um, I also wrote a lot of jingles during 1981 to 1991. I wrote 700 jingles uh, and uh, many of them also national songs. I worked on the, you know, in Singapore, we have the national anthem, but we also have the secondary anthems. And I was the music director for three of the four and I was the composer of the fourth one. Uh, which is called One People, One Nation, One Singapore. Uh, and, and, uh, and that was, uh, and I wrote a lot of uh, government campaign songs, propaganda songs like the courtesy campaign and the productivity campaign. Uh, and also a lot of uh, jingles for commercial companies like Kentucky Fried Chicken. My jingle was playing all over China uh, for more than two years. Uh, so in every store. So at that time, there was no royalties from China, so I didn't make that much money, but uh, maybe now, but now it's not happening. <laughs> so uh, Jingles was a very big part of, it really honed my compositional skills as I learned how to communicate to people, uh, you know, 15, 30 or, or 60 seconds. And, uh, and I think that was a very big lesson for me when I was doing that for that 10 years. Uh, after that, I uh, decided that I want to concentrate on my jazz career. So in 1991, um, I continued my jazz career and, uh, and uh, in the late 90s, I started to tour, uh, which was very interesting, traveling around the world and playing. Uh, I had a long residency in 1999 uh, at the uh, Shangri-La Blue Note Club uh, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, it's not a real Blue Note, but it was called the Blue Note. And uh, uh, I was there for only nearly six months. And after that, in the year 2000, is a very important year because it's the year that I started coming to Thailand, to Bangkok every single year and spending three or four months a year from 2000 until 2007. So that's where I got to meet such great musicians um, and to see how fantastic the jazz education and also the jazz scene and the, the international level of jazz that was found 
that is still found there today in, in Bangkok. So I was very honored and pleased and got to meet good friends like Hong and uh, Cole, Mr. Saxman and so on. And until today, we still make music together on a, on a regular basis. So, um, so more or less, that's a brief uh, uh, history of, of my career until the, today. Uh, I was very excited. This Last year, I turned 60 years old and this year I turned 61. And in this year, I, uh, uh, as um, Hong mentioned in the uh, introduction, uh, my album with LG Anderson and um, Louis Nash uh, got onto the uh, top 50 jazz charts, uh, make, making it into the top 20 as well, and uh, and stayed there for all, or almost 12 weeks. So it's possible. So I also will talk about it and how how you know one gets the visibility uh, of 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 being being seen and heard in in a place like the United States, which and we have to remember that jazz is the biggest artistic export and the biggest gift that uh, creative uh, artistic gift that America has given to the world, which is the music that we call jazz internationally. And, uh, and so really, you know, one has to really work hard to make sure that you're visible and you're seen and heard in the US so that then it will, you will resonate uh, around the world as well. So let me go back to the topic of today's uh, uh, lecture, basically, uh, and actually there can be two topics, and I guess I will use these two topics as my guiding um, principles uh, as I and as I speak to you today. Uh, on the poster, it says the craft, the art, and the business of music. But I also think secondarily, we can think about the ABC of art or music, and the A, is art for art's sake, the B is art for business sake, and the C is art for community sake. And I think that uh, there's always this argument about this and the principles and the ideals uh, behind wanting to create art. So as far as the craft is concerned, I think uh, that uh, uh, later, I mean, I'll, in a bit later, I'll talk to you about the difference between what is craft and what is art, okay? Uh, the craft is a really, uh, I'll give you an example. One time I went to, to uh, uh, Bali and, 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 and I, we were on the ground level of Bali and they were selling this famous statue of a fisherman with a net, an old man of the sea, which is a famous uh, sculpture that has been done by many, many people. Um, and so the guy was trying to sell me this sculpture and I asked him, you know, how much uh, this uh, sculpture is and he, and he said oh, so it's about roughly about 10, uh, 10 us dollars so i said okay let me think about it so then i went up to the mountains to ubud which is very famous for the very high level of craftsmen and someone came up to the to the uh, uh, uh the the vehicle which looks like a little bit like the tuk-tuk and and asked and said do we like to buy this uh same the same basically uh, uh statue and I looked at it and I, I asked, how much is it? And he says, 80 US dollars. And uh, I said, wow, you know, it's only $10 down in uh, Sano. Why is it 80 US dollars up here? And he says, sir, please take a good look at it. So I took the statue and I looked at it very, very carefully. And I started to see the face of this man, the fisherman, as though it's a real human being looking at me. I could even feel like the emotion of this fisherman that was the subject of this sculpture. Uh, and, and, and then I realized that, you know, in art, in craft, in cra a, this is the difference between craft and art. So one can be very well made. One can be uh, very well made, but also has a kind of a spirit in it as well. The same reason why you can hear someone play a tune like, let's say Danny Boy solo piano, right? And all the notes are correct. And, um, then you hear Keith Jarrett play Danny Boy, <laughs> and then you feel your hair go up on the on your neck, and you feel uh, stirring in your heart, and that is because this person is not just a craftsman, but also a, an artist. And I think that this is a uh, going back to to Keith Jarrett. He once said in an interview many years ago, about twenty five years ago, with um, 
uh, Down Meat magazine or Jazzy is one of the famous magazines. He said, and there are four different stages of a, uh, a jazz musician or a jazz musician's uh, career. The first is that you have to develop command of your instrument, meaning like your chops, right? You know, I mean, how well you play your skills and how well you'll be you're able to execute your in, uh, you know, for drums, your fundamentals, your rudiments, and also, you know, your fingering and just the way you play uh, the piano. So just, and then of course, just the strength and the dexterity to, to have command of your instrument. So one is uh, develop command. Second thing is to, to build a big enough, a big a repertoire that you can build. Uh, uh, and that is uh, very, very important because especially when you're young, you'll be four, you are 40 years old, it's easy to, to, rem to remember tunes and new songs. And re and, but after 40 years old, uh, it becomes harder and harder to retain. So for me now, if I memorize a song for a concert, if I have to, so I can retain it for two weeks after the concert and then it's gone. But if I try to play a song from the, I remembered in 70s or 1970s or 1980s or uh, uh, before I turned 40 years old, I can remember even until today. So that's why it's so important that uh, as a musician that you try your very best to uh, re build your repertoire now well you, when you're young and not wait too late because after that it becomes much harder. I always complain, you know, no, nowadays uh, my memory is not very good. And uh, another thing, uh, nowadays my, my memory is not very good. So, uh, so please remember the second part is to build your repertoire. The, the third part is, uh, is to develop beautiful phrasing. And uh, 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 phrasing is the most important. I mean, if you listen to Frank Sinatra, for example, the way he phrases, uh, I worked a, quite a lot with the great Japanese trumpet player, Taramasa Hino, who was the leader of the the full band of the Asian All Stars, and uh, he he's, he was the first uh, Asian musician to be on the U.S. Blue Note label, and uh, I mean you know basically that uh, he he used to really have amazing technique, but also beautiful phrasing, especially when he played ballads. So one day, uh, Taramasa was telling the story about how he was traveling with Dave Liebman and. Uh, and at the rehearsal, Dave Liebman said, man, I was trying to take a nap and there was a guy sleeping next to me in the next room and I and he was playing Johnny Mattis. I don't know if you know this singer, Johnny Mattis really loud and I couldn't get it. And then, he you know, at that time, a young musician said very quietly, uh, that was me. <laughs> and so then he asked, why were you listening to Johnny Mattis? He said, because uh, his phrasing is unbelievable you know that he can actually play such great phrasing on the i mean sing such great phrasing and he says that when i play ba a ballads on my trumpet i'm 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 just trying to emulate johnny mattis uh, phrasing so it's important not to just listen to musicians uh, other instrumentalists it's very important to listen to singers like frank sinatra or nat king cole or johnny mattis or any one of the great uh, vocalists, whether it's uh, jazz or pop, because you can really get a masterclass in phrasing. Uh, why is phrasing so important? Phrasing is the bridge from craftsmanship to artistry. And the more you develop your phrasing, uh, then you will be able to begin the journey and travel the journey of trying to go from craftsmanship to artistry. And uh, I think uh, that's very important. Then the fourth point that Keith Jarrett had, which was very interesting to me, was uh, that you try to develop a sound of your own, your own voice, such that when you play for the first 15 seconds or 30 seconds, people already knows who's that on the instrument. And, uh, and you know that this is Roy Haynes, 15 seconds, you know it's Roy Haynes, right? Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans, any one of them, you just have Miles Davis, just listen to 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and you know who it sounds like, right? Uh, I mean, some of the younger ones who have their own voice, everyone tries to, 
when I say younger, I mean younger compared to the very original ones. So people like uh, Michael Brecker, right? The last first few sounds, you know, it's him. Uh, and also Kenny Garrett, uh, also just a little bit, and you know, it's Kenny Garrett. I think it's very important that although we can emulate and follow the styles of our heroes and our masters, that we soon have to try to develop our own voice. If not, then we just become like a like a sounding board or an echo of the masters. And we not at all to disrespect the masters. We all stand on the shoulders of the masters. But the point is that at some point in your career, no hurry but at some point in your career to try and develop a voice that's uh, an amalgamation or coming together of the styles of all your heroes. And then from that amalgamation, slowly start to show uh, aspects of your playing that are truly you, right? So that's very important. But Keith Jarrett went on to talk about a fifth. Keith Jarrett talks a lot. So, you know, I mean, I love Keith Jarrett, but sometimes he does, uh, he's very, very vocal, and sometimes the people uh, do criticize him for that. But I, I understood what he was trying to say in this fifth point, which is uh, once you have your own style, be careful not to imitate yourself and become a parody of your own style. So I disagree with him when he used Oscar Peterson as an example that in his late career, Oscar was, according to Keith, not me, that. Oscar was trying to, uh, he was more or less just repeating and being a, become almost like a parody of his own self. I thought it was, that was quite disrespectful, but that everyone is used to the way Keith speaks. Uh, and and uh, But the point is that once you do develop your own style and your own voice, that you don't just, you know, uh, depend on it too long and, and, and start to, to, to become almost like a parody rather than a continual um discovery of your own self and a continual growth of your own self as you con you're continuing your journey to have your own your own voice so that's really uh more or less uh the journey of of the craftsman and then if i can just uh, of craft and going into the art of music and uh many examples that you know you can talk about how artistry is uh, that we listen now to whether brad meldow or Mm, the younger ones like that or other uh, wonderful musicians like the late Roy Hargrove and so on that just create beautiful art, so moving. End of the day, we artists are here uh, to move people, to communicate to people, uh, make them feel better, make them feel sadness if they cannot feel sadness, make them feel anger if they cannot feel anger, make them feel joy and, uh, and, and make them feel comfort. And that's really one of the main reasons that we are doing this thing called music. Um, going to the other secondary title to try and uh, talk about it. So art for art's sake. So that's really where it comes from. It's so important. It's the most important thing as a musician or artist is to develop the highest level of artistry, to have integrity and so on. But end of the day, the business of music becomes very, very important as well uh, because uh, we don't work in silo, we work in a community. And in the old days, like when it was Beethoven or, or Haydn or Wagner, the classical composers, right? How did they survive? They survived because the king or the duke hired them, gave them a beautiful house, a big piece of land, paid for their children to go to school, gave them gold, and all they had to do is create art create music. For in the case of Bach, he wrote music for worship, spiritual music most of the time um, for, in, for the church and so on and so forth. But he lived at the, the basically under the patronage of the royal families of the time. And that was how most musicians, Mozart and so on and so forth, all this, um, Mozart was very rebellious, so he fell in and out of favor with the uh, with the royalty. But, but uh, you know, really that's how they sustain themselves. Of course, in the 1900s is when musicians start to more or less fend for ourselves, you know. So we had to start doing gigs or we, our patron became either our sponsors, corporate sponsors later on, 
or the record companies who hired the musicians to to play and gave them advances as well as royalties from the sales. And so the business, it became a business as well. And it the, the, the thing about art, actually art is not meant, let me tell you the importance of, of the artist. The artist goes all the way back to primal times during the early man. And of course, in the olden days, right, in the going back to before men uh, were civilized and men first started living in villages, the artist was actually the shaman. Okay, I don't know what would be the correct term for shaman in Thai, but it's also like almost like witch doctor. So the the shaman would not go out hunting. Uh, he would stay uh, in the village. He would be the one to do the dance and get the people to do the dance to bring the rains. He would be the one who uh, would supervise the painting of in the caves. Like now we've seen many caves where you see all the beautiful art inside the caves. He would be the one to do the chanting and the dancing for people who are ill. He also was the herbologist and the doctor because he would get all the herbs and so on and so forth and boil and give people who are sick. Um, and they, he had a kind of a consciousness that was way above. And so every village had a, and every community back then had a shaman. After many hundreds of years and thousands of years, the, 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 the responsibilities have been divided, right? So medicine has gone to the doctors. And of course, you have the choreographers for dance. And, uh, and, and you have your meteorologists who tell you about what the weather is going to be tomorrow. But it all came down to just the shaman back in the old days. And the mind of the shaman was very important. The artist can help other people see things that they cannot see. Uh, example, when Christopher Columbus first came to the new land in South America on the three big Spanish galleons, right, the Nino, Pinto, and Santa Maria, as they're approaching, uh, the shaman was screaming to all the villagers, wow, look at all those three big of course, he didn't call it Spanish galleons, but look, there's those three big ships or whatever on the ocean. And historically, there's a record that none of the villagers saw these three huge ships on the horizon. They just couldn't see the brain and the programming didn't allow them to see the, uh, the three Spanish galleons. And then the shaman had to guide them. Okay, now you see the, the, the sea, now you see this brown thing until poop, suddenly they saw the three Spanish galleons. So that's the kind of role that we artists have, whether it's from visual art or dance or music in our case. Our role, one of our roles is to, to actually bring up feelings and open up people's imaginations with our ability to imagine and to use our craft and music uh, ability to, to, to let people see things they cannot see or feel things they cannot feel. So coming back to the business of music, I think that as a musician, many of us are told by our teachers, our friends, oh man, you know, this Facebook thing and the self-promotion, it's so obscene, you know, it's like, you know, I think the only important thing is just to be working on the music, you know, just care about the music and the you famous one that I would grow up listening to, or if you take care of the music, well, the music will take care of you. Yeah, maybe true to a certain extent, but, I think that if we are living in an age where if we do not put the effort in to market ourselves, we are not going to be able to reach out to the greater crowd around the world, or even in our, in our own country. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the young musicians once said to me, hey, Jeremy, I, you know, Wes Montgomery was a great guitar player and he didn't do any self-promotion. And I said, yes, because he had a team of six publicists two from his management company, two from his uh, agency, two from his record company, who did all the promotion for him, selling him to the world. Do you have six publicists? No, then who's going to do it? Then how is your music going to get out there? Now, another analogy, I think is a more gentle analogy on why it's so important for us musicians to, um, to market ourselves. Take Take that a farmer, imagine a farmer, let's say a fruit farmer who grows a lot of fruit in his big farm, right? He tends to his crop, he grows, you know, 
he grows it slowly and he looks after it, he waters it, he fertilizes it, and then the crops or the trees or whatever grow and then they start to flower and then they bear fruit. Then the fruit is ready for harvesting. And so the farmer will take the fruit from the harvest. So what does a farmer do? Does he just take the fruits and go and throw in the drain? Or does he take his fruits and go to the market and try to sell his fruits? And when he's at the market, he does he not have to say, hey, come and try my durian or come and try my whatever fruits that I'm selling and, and, and why? Then he can sell the fruit and he can make money and he can feed his family and he can feed himself and he can grow the next crop. You know, or he has to take the fruits to the roadside and stand there and wave at people passing by in the, and, and, and sell the fruit. So for an artist that doesn't understand that working on your music, creating your music is the first part. It's like growing your crop and harvesting your crop. And marketing yourself and being savvy in the business side of music is like selling your crop. And what if you are successful to sell your crop, then you can, like I said, not only uh, look after yourself and feed yourself. And when you have kids, you want to send your kids to college or you want to send them overseas to study, uh, you can do it because you have take the trouble, taken the trouble to make sure that you can uh, make a decent living from the music. And then um, uh, that's uh, really what uh, uh, it's very, very important. And later on, if you want to ask me questions about how to do it, uh, I'd be very well, very happy to, to do that with you. The last one uh, on my secondary title, which is the arts for community sake, ABC, C is community. As you grow older, you start to realize just like the shaman of old, you have a usefulness and you have a mission and, and you have a duty to make sure that you use the influence that you, as you grow older, that you have as an artist building your audience your audience becomes almost like a constituency for a politician and how to bring people together and how to you know use music this powerful thing of music to make people feel better to make people to use it in a way to heal people from the troubles of the of the of the world uh, i mean art blakey said uh, jazz or music is there to wash away the dust of everyday life and I think this is very important that we must understand that we have this ability. Um, how I have built a loving audience in Singapore uh, and around the world, maybe more in Singapore when I play my club gigs, give me, I give you, I'll give you one example of what it means to be a musician. Maybe musicians play and then during the break time, they, they run off to have a cigarette. Okay, that's fine if you want to run off to have a cigarette, but then, it's important to engage with your audience who come to see you. Um, for example, very often, I mean, somebody was one time when this guy came up to me and said, hey, Jeremy, I'm sorry. I know it's only 11 p.m. and I know you got one more set, but I'm so sorry, but I have to rush home and get some rest because tomorrow morning I have to take my daughter to her dance recital in school tomorrow morning. And, uh, and so I got to get up early and do that. I said, no problem, man. I'll see you another time now. Two weeks later, when he comes back to the club, after I ask him, hey, how are you, man? He said, good. I will ask him, how was your daughter's recital? I don't have to do that. But when you do that all the time with the people that come to see you, they, it's not their duty to come and see you. You know, It's a huge effort to take a shower, put on some nice clothes, drive all the way to the club or the concert hall. They are doing you a, a great, great act of respect and love. And so we can't just push it away and not realize how important it is. You know, at the end of a performance, very often we musicians, we bow and most musicians will take a deep bow. And where does that come from? Back to the time of royalty, when the musicians perform for the royal family and when they finish, and the royal family or and all the noble people and later on the people from the public give them the applause it's a very high gesture of respect and that's why we musicians bow very deeply to our audience and not just bow physically but in our heart we have to understand that 
that they are not doing us a favor being there. Uh, they're giving us an honor to be there, to listen to us. And we must return the honor. And back to the community. So whatever way you can serve in the community, bringing people together. I know, for example, some of your uh, lecturers in Slapakon, they go up very often to Chiang Mai and they, they, they teach uh, students over there and, uh, and uh, reach out to the various communities, uh, even like embassies to cultural diplomacy is very, very important for the community to build, to help uh, the politicians can do their, all their uh, uh, diplomacy, but we as artists also can do our own cultural diplomacy to bring our music uh, to around the world and, and, and engage people and have uh, bring people together so that even though we may have borders, geographical and political borders between our country, when it comes to art, there's no borders at all. It's just all one family. We must work together to produce good art. And uh, so more or less, I think um, those are my thoughts about um, uh, both the craft, the craft and uh, the art and the uh, business of music and also A for uh, arts, arts for arts sake, arts for business sake and arts for community sake. Uh, and so with that, I, I think I'll hand over now to the moderators uh, to see if there are any questions uh, that, uh, that any of you may have. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. That was um, quite a, uh, I mean, informative um, lecture on the uh, arts for arts sake, music for but um, community and, and, and for the business sake, right? And I, I really like the part that you mentioned about the four stages, according to Keith Jarrett, to become, a, to become an artist, right? Um, the one with the like, command of your instrument, the repertoire, the you know, phrasing, and the, um, like, your original sound, right? I think that, that's very important to becoming a, you know, a true jazz artist. Thank you very much for that, Jeremy. Um, so we have about 40 people um, in the Zoom chat uh, from both Silpacon and other institutions. And we also have like people from jazz department, from music business department, and also some from graduate, um, some, some are graduate students, like for example, Mr. Jurin Kelly, um, um, right there. Uh, I think Jurian, you haven't met Mr. Jeremy Montero before. Um, Jurian is uh, um, just joined us two years ago. Um, he's now the full-time teacher um, from UNC University of Northern Colorado, um, and he's um, you know great um, jazz vocalist. And we 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 are so happy to have you joining um, Silvergon um, and some other graduate students like uh, Mark. Chasayam, who have performed with uh, Jeremy before um, in Singapore and, and in, in Thailand uh, as part of the TIJC um, Jazz Conference Festival. And we have quite a few um, international students like uh, Fan Fan from Macau, from, from China, right? Um, uh, Fan Fan is um, our graduate student studying jazz, um, jazz drumming with me. Um, glad to have you uh, here and fun and some other jazz students so it's um and also we have about 30 people watching from facebook live um ถ้าใครมีคําถามจาก facebook แล้วก็คําถามจากทั้งเอ่อในในซูมแชทสามารถถามได้เลยนะครับเป็นภาษาไทยก็ได้เดี๋ยวอาจารย์จูเลียนกับอาจารย์น้องจะแปลให้เอ
form a group or get a group together is to look for musicians who resonate with you on various levels. Uh, they have similar mission and similar aesthetic and, uh, and, 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 but what's also very important is to look for people who do not have any huge character clashes, you know, uh, this not to mean that we don't look for other musicians to work with us who are able to challenge us in a, in an intelligent and a fair way so that we are then able to uh, uh, lift our game as well. Uh, I want to just share something that a close friend, I think uh, Hong has met him as well. He used to own all the Dan Ryan's restaurants uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong and Taiwan. His name is Paul Christensen. And he used to be the senior vice president of the Standard Chartered Bank in the UK. And he said, what I love about jazz and what I love about banking in the old days is that the bosses or the leaders are not afraid to hire people who are as good or if not as good, better than them. And when you think about Miles Davis, think about how he hired cats that are in a sense, right? better than him, right? I mean, like Kirby or Ron Carter or, or Tony Williams. I use the word better here, not saying that better than the genius and imagination and presence of Miles Davis, but he knew that these guys were so powerful. And then he was the one who used to say after three years or four years, okay, you're too good now, get out of my band, go start your own band, you know? And uh, in forming your own band, look for like-minded people with similar aesthetic and who are not difficult to get along with, although it's okay if they are uh, able to add, give you ideas and challenge you to make the group better. Uh, I guess I'm speaking more philosophically than practically about that, but uh, that's what I have for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, จริงๆ um, Yeah, I can say that I think uh, I So uh, Jeremy allow us to translate into Thai for for sure, those yeah, of listening out there. Okay. So Julian, would you do me a favor translating everything into Thai? Show your Thai chop a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make me as nervous as it used to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, ต้องคิดเรื่องอะไรบ้างเวลาเวลาทําวงใหม่โดยเฉพาะวงที่ที่เล่นเพลงแต่งเพลงออริจินอลอืมเค้าก็เลยตอบประมาณว่าเราจะ
มีใครในนี้มีคำถามเพิ่มเติมไหมครับ anyone um, uh, another question s before, before anyone asks can I ask something <laughs> okay hi Jeremy uh, hi. in aspect of business uh, I would like to ask about um, what the situation now in uh, in Singapore about music business in 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 pandemic uh, era like this especially jazz uh, 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 for example in my country jazz is like a niche market is not a mainstream music Uh, so uh, the effect on the pandemic may be may be very very effect with 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 us. What about Singapore? Uh, what the situation over there about music business over there? I think uh, jazz is a niche business everywhere in the world, not just Thailand. <laughs> so we, you know because we are definitely a, a, a minority. Uh, but it's a growing. Uh, it's a growing. It's a big niche. It's not a small niche. And so I think if you look at our communities in every country and you add it up, you know it's a few tens of millions of people around the world who love jazz. So it's not that small a community, and um, uh, it's the same over here. Not just jazz musicians; many musicians have got no work now for a year and a half, and uh, the clubs are still closed. We have started allowing concerts in Singapore. And uh, previously, it's only 50 people or 100 people, and maximum 250 people. So I'm very glad my next concert on the 18th of September, uh, the we are allowed to have 500 people. The first time they can have a group, although the concert hall can hold 1,500 because of the rules, uh, we can have up to 1,000 if the hall is very, very, very big. Then still with the spacing, you can have up to 1,000. But the Esplanade Concert Hall, which some of you know. Uh, with a capacity of 1,500, we will only be allowed to have 500. This is only going to be my third concert hall performance since March to 2020. And uh, it'll be my uh, fifth performance. I, I had the chance to play twice in a club. We were allowed to play in a club, but no food and no drinks can be sold. So the club actually had to give a voucher so that you can come back tomorrow when there's no music and order food and drinks <laughs> so it was not easy but at least we got to play a little bit most musicians have no work some of us who have found a way to pivot to live stream and able to monetize the live stream um, uh, have been quite lucky and some of us who have learned to adapt to doing for example session work uh, for other artists to to play uh, to set up a good studio like I know Hong is a wonderful studio, uh, you know, where he can do drum tracks for people, uh, other friends of mine as well, and uh, and and or, or do guitar parts or teach online. A friend of mine in Singapore, uh, drummer Tamago, he actually teaches uh, about 40 students in China now uh, online uh, uh, on a regular basis. And so many musicians who are a bit technical savvy have found a way to to pivot towards um, earning an income from teaching or doing online work. But the majority, I would say 80%, don't know how to do it. Just the good players, they play the instrument very well, they work very hard. And um, so of course, the, uh, we are lucky in Singapore, the government has given some help to such people. Many have taken jobs. Uh, I know friends of mine who have taken the jobs as a store man. Some of them took jobs as a COVID swabber on the border. So they... Uh, uh, and the salary is not bad. At least they can they can they can pay their bills. And also, I I am also the executive director, music director of the Jazz Association Singapore. We have a, a jazz crisis fund to help jazz musicians who need some financial help during the short short term financial help. Uh, so, but it's not ideal. I mean, those of us who have jobs as teachers or lecturers or professors or, or are lucky because and uh, some. Uh, Orchestral musicians, uh, TV musicians, radio orchestras, also they still have work. But uh, I, I really feel so bad. Many symphony orchestras are closing down around the world as well. Uh, they just cannot, uh, the funding is not enough to keep them going. Uh, very sad to see the Malaysian Philharmonic having to also pretty much close down, uh, actually downsized now to just being a very small uh, outfit. It's, it's very, very sad. Um, and yeah, so that it's it's not a good scene. I mean, and now also things are maybe getting better a little bit, 
because there are two approaches to COVID. One is to allow uh, to live with, if there's a high vaccination rate, you can more or less live within uh, COVID as an endemic and where, where it won't overwhelm the medical system. Or other countries like Australia, uh, New Zealand, that are, they are trying to go continue to go for zero cases. Who knows which is, I don't know, <laughs> which is the best way. But uh, yeah, it's a difficult time for, for musicians. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. I think it's uh, almost similar, the same as here. Yeah. And maybe around the world. Yes, Julian, do you have any, anything to share about US, the situation? In the US, a lot of it, I think, is the same. It kind of depends. Right now, things are, when I was there, at least, you know, Delta hadn't turned its ugly head. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people are doing just that. They're trying to find other avenues in working in music. So I know a lot of people have really improved their home studios mm -hmm. and they've started recording for artists in place of, of going out and playing live, which is, it's also something that I've started doing here as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's everywhere. Um, a lot of live stream performances. I know at one point there was a club in Denver called Dazzle. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody's been able to, if any of our Thai students or teachers have been able to visit there in Colorado, but um, they were doing live streams where they would clear out the entire club and, uh, and they would have a band play there and then they would live stream it and then take donations online. Mm -hmm. so, mm. A lot of people's creative solutions, especially in the age of technology, I think are yeah. around the same. Mm, yeah, for survival. <laughs> Thank you very much. อ่ามีมีใครจะถามคําถามอะไรมั้ยคะมาร์คอยากถามอะไรมั้ยคะยิ้มเราเอาเอาคําถามจากคนในซูมก่อนก็ได้ครับแล้วตอนนี้มีค
capabilities have gone up quite a few times and I didn't know how to do video editing before, but now I can do video editing, not as good as some professional professionals, but at least I know how to do. So rather than just to, for the young ones who are still able to sustain either with a side job or, by the way, I, 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 your burgers look amazing whenever I see them on, <laughs> on, or when you share the photos and I, you know, sometimes when I look at your burgers, my mouth is watering, you know. So, and I'm wondering whether when you can send the delivery to the burgers to Singapore. But like you, right? I mean, it's, okay, let me just take an example of New York musicians and New York dancers and actors. Many of them, they, they, they have to still pay the bills, pay the rent and so on. So what do they do? They wait on tables. They are waiters. And there's, there's absolutely no feelings of diminishing themselves when they do this thing. They serve people in restaurants or they work, uh, you know, manning a ticket counter or they work security or whatever. And then they wait for an audition. They go for audition. They get it or they don't get it. Sometimes they get it. They go, oh, wow, three months now I can be an actor or a dancer or a musician for a Broadway or off-Broadway play. And then I can earn, earn my money as a musician. Then if the play ends and there's no immediate part given to them, you just go back to uh, becoming a waiter at a Olive Tree Italian restaurant. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of us Asian musicians, we have a real negative thing that, you know, uh, I, Okay, let me just share one very big guiding principle for me. The difference between your work and your job. Your job is what you do to pay the bills. Your work is your life mission. The thing that you want to give the world and yourself. So, for example, in Singapore, I've come across this guy. From Monday to Friday, he drives a taxi. Saturday, Sunday, he goes to the Salvation Army to help at the church, to help the poor people and distribute food. And uh, that's his work. His job is driving taxi Monday to Friday. So for me, when I was a teenager, I worked as a waiter as well. And, uh, and um, later on, I, I, I did some other jobs not related to music. Uh, but lucky, most of the time, I can do music. But then I also have, within music, the things I do as my job and the things I do as my work. My job is to play. I used to joke that the, I make my most money playing a corporate function where no one's listening to me, but they give me a lot of money. That's my job. My work is to play in a quiet jazz club with 50 people, 100 people, and everyone's listening, and I can do my thing. And, and then once we understand that all of us have to, to, to understand and be very clear what is our job, could be music, could be driving taxi, could be making burgers, could be waiting on tables, and our job to pick up the saxophone or to, to play the instrument. And once we have this attitude, I think we will be okay even during this difficult time. Thank you, Jeremy. ขออนุญาตแปลนิดนึงเนาะสําหรับนักศึกษาที่ฟังอยู่จริงๆคําถามที่ดีมากของของเอ่อคุณชัศยานนะครับ uh, มาร์คของเรานะมือแซกที่เก่งมากๆเอ่อถามเกี่ยวกับเรื่องของแพนเดมิกใช่มั้ยเพราะว่าโควิดว่ามันทํายังไงในเรื่องของคนกระทบกับ
ในเรื่องของความเป็นชาติเอเชียเราอาจจะไม่ค่อยที่จะดูทางนั้นดูทางด้านนี้ที่เรามีงานหลายๆด้านทํางานหลายๆศาสตร์ที่จะมาเติมเต็มการทํางานของเรื่องของศิลปะในเรื่องของดนตรีของเราก็ส่งเสริมให้มีเรื่องของอาชีพเสริมในหลายด้านในการที่จะยุ่งแล้วก็อาชีพเสริมแล้วก็ในสิ่งที่เราอยากจะเรียนรู้ใหม่ๆในช่วงของโควิดนี้ด้วยก็จะเป็นทําทําให้เราเนี่ยยุ่งอยู่ทําให้เราไม่คิดมากทําให้เราไม่ฟุ้งซ่านในความเป็นดนตรีเนี่ยสำหรับเรื่องในช่วงในช่วงของโควิดก็จะทําให้เรามีอะไรที่เหมือนค่าเวลาอะไรได้เยอะขึ้นหวังว่าจะตอบคําถามของของมาร์กเนาะนะครับดีเลยครับขอบคุณสําหรับคําตอบครับขอบคุณครับมาร์กมีคําถามอะไรเพิ่มเติมจากในนี้ไหมเอ่ยในซูมค่ะแก้วแก้วยกมือค่ะแก้วยกมือครับอ๋อฟันฟันสอรี่ฟันฟันค่ะฟันฟันครับฟันฟัน shoot shoot your question Yeah, hi Jeremy. Very nice to meet you. Hi. Yeah, and there has a question that I would like to ask you is: at the very beginning, how did you get the resource to let people to know about you or your band in Singapore? It's a good question, and actually, uh, it's related to what we just talked about. So. I was doing jingles from 1981 and till 1991, and uh, jingles is very good money. Uh, now not so much, but back then, uh, uh, you know, you you could earn a lot of money doing jingles, and very often you only have to spend about 35, 40 percent of what you charge the client to cover your costs, your musicians, recording studio, and so on. So the rest of it, uh, you know, you do it's your own income. And as a result of being able to have a good job of not worrying about money, I was able to play a lot of jazz gigs for little or no money, and become more and more well known in the local circles. Of uh, so, I think that, uh, for example, if some of you can find a way to, I mean, there there are great musicians. Like I think I've spoken to Hong before about Michael Brecker, right? I mean, he's such a great great. Jazz musician, but he makes he used to make when he was alive, right? He used to make tons of money playing pop, like uh, when he was playing with Paul Simon. I mean, he shared with me because I played with Simon and Garfunkel as well with him on one okay occasion, and uh, uh, basically he said, you know, he was so open. You know, he makes about ten or eleven thousand US dollars for one show, and uh, and 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 then he's also given a ten minute feature. Of his music, <laughs> not Paul Simon's, and he also has a full page in a concert program about his latest album. But as much as Michael Brecker played so well on the pop, right? It was his job. He loved his job, of course. But that allowed him to then go and make a lot less money with the Brecker brothers, traveling and playing the music he loved. So. Sometimes I see some jazz musicians who are so good playing pop, but they are oh, I don't want to play any pop. But if you play pop and is a pop band is willing to pay you good money, just take the job because then it allows you to do this work of yours that means so much to your soul and to your heart. Because if you just sit there and not really understand uh, that you know you have to feed your family and feed yourself and and so on, uh, it's it can be very you can make. We can make our lives very difficult for ourselves. So, so I would say that. Sorry, I'm talking about the last question because your your question as well, Fan Fan, is about this, about how if you really find a way to, uh, make sure that your sustenance is covered, that you can go and do a lot of things in, let's say, jazz. I don't, you know, you're studying jazz, right? Yeah. Yes. And then then you can go and do a lot of things with jazz, and it doesn't matter at that point. Whether it's little or a lot of money or whatever, because you're already okay in terms of, uh, of of your of your income. So I think there's a, a good approach for when you are starting out, or even even me now. I mean, someone asked me to do a, a arrangement of a folk song or something. You know, it may not be the most and something I'm crazy about, but if it if it's good money, I do it so that I can just worry about my jazz. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Jeremy. Thank you. Okay, ah, ah, plan, me, ah, people, plan, no. Okay, ah, 
ก็เจอร์มี่คำถามของฟันๆนะคะก็คือว่าเจอร์มี่สตาร์ทเหมือนเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มที่จะทำมีเริ่มแคริเอร์พาดยังไงก็คือเริ่มเป็นนักดนตรีจ๊ะยังไงนะคะเจอร์มี่เนี่ยก็เลยเล่าไปถึงว่าเมื่อตอนหนึ่งเก้าเก้าหนึ่งเนาะเขาเขาเขาเขาแต่งจิงเกิลเยอะมากซึ่งตอนตอนนักขนาดนั้นนะคะการแต่งจิงเกิลพวกนี้มันได้เงินเยอะมากเลยเขาก็เลยกลับไปพอยต์ก่อนหน้านี้ที่เขาพูดว่าระหว่างจ็อบกับเวิร์กอะค่ะคือเราควรจะมีจ็อบที่ที่แม้ว่าเราจะไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ชอบมันมากหรืออาจจะไม่ใช่สิ่งที่เราภาคภูมิใจกับมันมากนักแต่ถ้ามันทําเงินให้เรามากพอเนี่ยมันก็จะมากพอที่เราจะเอาเอาความสบายใจตรงเนี้ยไปทำเวิร์กของเราแล้วเราก็จะสร้างตัวตนได้แล้วก็จะสร้างงานของเราได้นะคะเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยอันดับแรกเลยคือถ้าเรายังต้องนั่งคิดถึงปากท้องว่าเราเราทำสิ่งสิ่งนี้ไปแล้วเราก็ไม่ค่อยได้เงินจ่ายค่าอะไรก็ไม่ได้ดูแลลูกดูแลครอบครัวอะไรก็ไม่ได้เนี่ยเราจะไม่ไม่เหลือไม่เหลือความแบบความคิดหรือว่าเหลือความสุนทรีอะไรไปแต่งแต่งเพลงหรือว่าไปทํางานที่เราชอบเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยก็อ,อยากให้คิดแยกเหมือนมีคอนเซ็ปต์แยกกันว่าระหว่างจ็อบกับเวิร์กนะคะก็คือว่าเราอาจจะต้องทำในสิ่งที่ได้เงินเพียงพอให้เราสแตนได้อยู่ได้อย่างอย่างสบายใจเพื่อที่จะเอาไปทำเอาเวลาเอาความเอาความสบายใจสิ่งนี้ไปทำในสิ่งที่เราอยากจะให้เราเป็นค่ะขอบคุณครับชันนองครับมีคำถามเพิ่มเติมจากในนี้ไหมเรามีตอนนี้โอ้โหห้าสิบกว่าคนในในซูมครับผมมีคำถามเชิญเลยครับน้องพัดครับอาชีพของนักดนตรีนันตีในแต่ละวันนะที่เขาเล่นปิโนอะ่ะเขาเขามีการทำต้องซ้อมทุกวันเลยไหมผมก็ถามนิดหนึ่งโอเคอ่า there's a question Jeremy uh, he asked about uh, a musician life maybe maybe he wants to ask about your your routine life about musician how how you you spend time for uh, practicing doing work or uh, maybe you can you can share us your routine days <laughs> Is there any possible to to to? to... Yeah, I can share. And I, I I I actually I I really this is I I really I think for me is I I, I overwork. Uh, and uh, maybe at age 61 I shouldn't work so hard, but I love I love it so much. So I can't uh, I can't really avoid it. Because besides being a, a a musician that wants to maintain my level and continue growing and learning, I have my own production company for 31 years now, uh, Showtime Productions. Uh, you know, I'm a founder of the Composers and Author Society of Singapore, where I'm a director as well as a chairman of the licensing committee uh, re regarding the copyright and the distribution of royalties in Singapore. Uh, I used to be on the government stat board uh, as, as a council member of the National Arts Council. Uh, now I don't don't sit on the board, but I still um, consult and uh, and spend time talking to my friends there. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, many other things that I, I I'm doing at the same time. Um, but I think for me, it's very important uh, to know what is my core, and my core is I'm a musician. This is everything else I do is just orbiting around the fact that I'm a musician. And if my time as a musician uh, is not Is not possible. Then I'm I'm horrible with everything else. My whole life is falls apart. So I the the center of my life is music, and so example now I have a concert on September 18th. I mentioned, um, and I practice two or three hours a day. Uh, sometimes I can do it two hours and then at night another one hour, and the way I practice is a uh, quite methodical. Uh, uh, my, I always start off with a ballad. Any ballad, and that centers me and brings me to the present moment and to my instrument, and into music. And after I've done that for 10 minutes uh, playing ballad, I will do all my scales, whether it's a hannon, and also I've developed many new bebop exercises for the hands besides playing the classical scales and the um, hannon and and uh, major and chromatic scales. I also have a uh, Develop my own um, bebop scales to help me with uh, playing patterns and, and and licks and so on and so forth. After I've done that for maybe half an hour, uh, I will move on to playing tunes. Peter Bernstein 
practices only on tunes, he says. He tells me that. I, I don't really believe him because I'm sure he does more than just that. And basically, uh, uh, he, he uses the tunes to do everything, to get his uh, physical technique, stamina practice going. And I yeah, I do play. I play. Firstly, I will play. What I will practice first if I have a show is I will work on my the new tunes, maybe up to one hour of the new tunes that I want to learn. Then I have a very special part of my practice regime, which I call facing my demons, right? Which is the things that I don't like to do. Or for example, I in the for for 10 years ago, I spent one whole year facing one demon, learning how to play in seven in a flowing manner, right? And uh, I, I remember that even when I went on holiday, my wife to New York, I, New York, I would still book a rehearsal studio for practice studio for two hours. And I used to go in the studio and I used to practice trying to play more and more fluently in seven. I still am not as good as I want to be, but many or very often, you know, people say, oh, I don't like to play in seven, well, but actually it's not they don't like, it's just they cannot play in seven. <laughs> And the thing is that you have to keep on facing your demons until a point that it's uh, uh, very, very comfortable for you. Then you find some other demon, is it whether it's playing in fives or whether it's trying to, someone else asked in the chat group about is the piano, uh, uh, you know, can you play your piano as a solo instrument or, or uh, you know, play with uh, as a band. And actually uh, this year of COVID, a year and a half, uh, I realized that as much as the piano is an instrument within a band, I posted a practice session on myself uh, maybe a week ago with the overhead camera as well, talking about how the piano is a bad instrument, but many jazz pianists become very lazy and just step chords and then solo, 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 step chords and then solo. But the piano is a is a is like an orchestra. You have to get your left hand going, not just stride piano, which is wonderful, but there's so many things. If you listen to Brad Meldau, counter melodies or like Bach three-part inventions where you have three different things going on at the same time. Uh, and this, this COVID time, I mean, it's not a good time at all, but it has served me in giving me the time to play much better solo piano without accompaniment. And so then, for example, this could be one demon that you have to face as a pianist who only steps left hand chords. And even if you play really well, you know, you can play really wonderful Phineas newborn licks on your right hand, but then if you can't do it with two hands, then that's not it, man. So you have to really uh, 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 work on uh, fine things that... Then then at the end of the, the whole... I must emphasize about the skills playing and the attitudes because I compared to a boxer, you know, a boxer goes in the ring and train, but before he gets in the ring, he runs on the beach. And uh, musicians playing scales and playing uh, arpeggios and, and all, all this kind of stuff is the same thing as a boxer going to run on the beach before you even get to the training. Uh, in China, the musicians often also refer to their craft and their ability as Kung Fu, you know. You know, and, uh, and basically, to, we must have, you must develop good Kung Fu on your, on your instrument. And uh, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Ah, uh, ah, uh, คำถามของน้องพัทนะคะก็คือว่าวันอ่าการการเป็นนักดนตรีอ่าอ่า translate for a moment. Ah, uh, um, ก็คือว่าอ่าทั้งวันนะคะในฐานะนักดนตรีของเจอร์มี่เนี่ยทำอะไรบ้างนะคะก็อ่าคำตอบของเขาก็คือจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยเขาทำหลายอย่างนะคะนอกจากนอกจากเป็นนักดนตรีแล้วเนี่ยเขาก็มีจ็อบอย่างอื่นอีกนะคะมีหลายๆอย่างที่ที่ทำมีมีเรื่องเกี่ยวกับ copyright ที่เขาเป็นเป็นเป็นไปไปทำอ่าอยู่หรือว่าเป็นทํางานให้อ่ารัฐบาลนะคะเป็นเป็นเหมือนเป็นคอนเซิลให้หรืออะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะแต่ว่าทั้งนี้ทั้งนั้นทั้งหมดทั้งมวลเขาก็จะบอกว่าเราสุดท้ายแล้วไม่ว่าเราจะทําอะไรเยอะแยะแค่ไหนเราต้องรู้ว่าเซนเตอร์ของเราจริงๆหรือหรือชีวิตของเราจริงๆเนี่ยเราจะเป็นอะไรนะคะสําหรับเขาก็คือเขาเป็นเขาเป็นนักดนตรีเนี่ยเขาก็จะต้องอคิดแล้วว่าอะไรสําคัญที่สุดในการเป็นเป็นเป็นเป็นในชีวิตเขาก็คือเขาก็เป็นนักดนตรีเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยเขาก็จะต้องแบ่งเวลาในการที่จะฝึกหรือว่าจะพัฒนาสกิลเขาให้เพิ่มมากขึ้นอย่างเงี้ยค่ะเขาก็เล่าคร่าวๆว่าเหมือนกับ
ในหนึ่งวันเนี่ยเขาจะใช้เวลาซ้อมอยู่ประมาณ 2-3 ถึงชั่วโมงอาจจะเป็นกลางวันอสองชั่วโมงหนึ่งชั่วโมงก่อนอในช่วงค่ําหรืออะไรก็ตามเนี่ยแล้วก็รูทีนในการทําเนี่ยค่ะก็จะเริ่มจากการเล่นบอลลาดก่อนเพราะว่ามันเหมือนให้เราทุนอินเข้ามาสู่ในสิ่งที่เราจะทํานะคะก็คือเหมือนหาให้เขาอยู่กับสิ่งที่เขากำลังจะทํากําลังจะซ้อมแล้วก็อยู่กับเครื่องดนตรีของเขาให้ได้ก็เหมือนเหมือนดึงความสนใจเข้ามาให้ให้มีสมาธิหลังจากนั้นเขาจะเริ่มฝึกสเกลต่างๆแฮนด์นอนหรือว่าเมเจอร์ไมเนอร์นะคะแล้วก็เขาก็จะฝึกบีบอปสไตล์ของเขาที่เป็นสเกลของเขานะคะอยู่สักประมาณ30นาทีนะคะแล้วจากนั้นเนี่ยเขาก็จะเริ่มฝึกทูนก็คือฝึกเพลงนะคะ,ะเขาก็เขาก็แนะนําว่าเหมือนเขากำลังจะมีคอนเสิร์ตใหม่เนี่ยเขาจะเริ่มด้วยเพลงเพลงที่เขาต้องหัดใหม่ก่อนอ่าแล้วก็ในในแต่ละครั้งที่เขาซ้อมหรือในแต่ละช่วงพิเรียดที่เขาซ้อมเนี่ยเขาจะมีการชาเลนจ์ตัวเองก็เหมือนเหมือนที่เขาบอกว่า feeding the demon อย่างเงี้ยค่ะก็คือเหมือนกับว่าทําในสิ่งที่ตัวเองไม่ชอบก็คืออ่ารู้ว่าอย่างอย่างเขาเขาก็บอกว่ามีอยู่ช่วงหนึ่งที่เขาไม่อยากเล่นสเกลไม่อยากเล่นเซเว่นอย่างเงี้ยค่ะคือเขาก็เขาก็ใช้เวลาเป็นปีหรือแม้กระทั่งเขาเดินทางไปไปอ่าเอ๊ะจำไม่ได้ว่านิวยอร์กหรือเปล่าเออเขาเขาก็ยังไปเช่าสตูดิโอเพื่อเพื่อเพื่อใช้สองชั่วโมงในการแบบชาเลนจ์ตัวเองสิ่งเนี้ยให้ได้แล้วเขาก็เหมือนกับเขาก็เขาก็เขาก็บอกว่าบางครั้งอะที่คนเราบอกว่าเราไม่เล่นนี่เราไม่เล่นนั่นหรือเราไม่ทํานี้ไม่ทํานั่นจริงๆอาจจะไม่ใช่เพราะเราไม่ทําแต่จริงคือเราทําไม่ได้หรือเปล่าอะไรเงี้ยก็มันเป็นการชาเลนจ์ตัวเองของเขาอะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะแล้วก็เอ่อเขาก็บอกว่าโดยเฉพาะในช่วงพันธมิตรตรงเนี้ยค่ะโควิดตรงเนี้ยเขาก็อยากจะให้มองว่ามันเป็นชาเลนจ์ไปเป็นสิ่งที่ดีเนี่ยในช่วงโควิดเองเนี่ยเขาก็เขาก็เขาเรียกอะไรอะเสริมสกิลตัวเองหรือพัฒนาตัวเองโดยการเริ่มแบบพยายามพยายามซ้อมเล่นโซโล่ขอเปียโนของตัวเองที่เป็นเครื่องเดี่ยวเนี่ยโดยที่ไม่มีเครื่องดนตรีประกอบก็ถือว่าเป็นเหมือนเป็นพีเรียดที่ที่ที่ก็ถือซะว่าไม่ต้องทําอะไรเยอะก็จะได้มีการโฟกัสทําอะไรบางอย่างที่เขาอยากทําอะไรเงี้ยค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะประจันน้องที่แปลให้โอ้แปลละเอียดเลยครับอ่าคำถามมีคําถามจากทางป้าหรือว่าคำเอาเอาคำถามจากทางนี้ก็ได้ครับมีคําถามอะไรเพิ่มเติมไหมเอ่ยน้องๆอยู่กันสี่สิบกว่าคนตอนนี้ถามภาษาไทยได้นะมีของน้องเจนที่พิมพ์แชทเข้ามาในในแชทซูมครับพี่องครับในแชทซูมใช่ไหมครับคำถามคืออะไรนะอ๋อโอเคนักนักดนตรีระดับโลกทางคุณเจเรมี่ติดต่อหรือทำอย่างเช่นไรถึงจะได้เล่นเตรียมตัวอย่างไรให้เจเรมี่เอ่อ there's a question in the zoom chat regarding um, working with um, world class musician like yeah, you have worked with James yeah. Woody you have worked with Ernie Watts you have worked with Anyone, like you know, A-list um, yeah. jazz musician, including yourself. Um, so, how do you approach contacting them in the first place, and do you have any like preparation, you know, before working with them? Could you share well, a sure. bit about your stories? Well, firstly, when I want to contact you, Hong, I just send you a WhatsApp, <laughs> and then we work together. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, uh, I want to just say uh, that Hong is uh, one of my favorite drummers in the whole world, and I have played with some of the greatest, uh, Al Foster, and uh, and people like that. And so you know, it's always an honor to play with him. Uh, also, you are lucky to have him. Hong is mine. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. And um, it's very kind of you to say that. Thank you. <laughs> it's true. And anyway, uh, uh. There's a famous about well, James Moody used to say this: wherever you go, there you are. Right, and what that means is, basically, uh, if you have an attitude, especially now with internet and all the connections that we can have. Although yes, uh, there is some benefit from to be like in right in the middle of New York City, or if you're working very heavily with movies, to be in Los Angeles is true, but most of the time you can do almost. Everything uh, being anywhere in the world, whether it's Thailand or Kuala Lumpur, London or, or Paris or Singapore or Malaysia, so it really it doesn't matter uh, so much as it used to before the age of the of the internet. And my very first big name jazz artist that I got to play with is Ernie Watts, and uh, we went on to we have gone on to play forty or fifty shows. Uh, And concerts uh, since 1987 and until now, and uh, and I got a chance to produce one of his albums um, called Stand Up, which is out of print now uh, from a Dutch label, Odyssey Records. So um, 
basically I, I call Ernie's management office and his manager, normally they will never ask you to call the artist, you know, they will deal directly with you and they will not even let you talk to the artist. But the manager liked me so much in our phone conversation. She said, hey, Ernie's in Arizona now and I know he's not doing anything right now. So why don't you call him in his hotel? And this is the number and the room number. And I call him up and I say, hey, Ernie, the, you know, Nancy gave me your phone number and I want to just say how much I love your playing for so many years. And I, I would love to invite you to come and play in Singapore with my band. And he was, then he was very nice and very friendly. And then he said, okay, Jeremy, it's the first time I'm working with you. So if you can send me a cassette of what your band sounds like, you know, at that time it's cassette, not like now you just send MP3 here. Then I will get back to you. And uh, I sent him a cassette. And then one day, you know, at uh, three in the morning, my home phone rang and I pick up the phone and say, hey, Jeremy, it's Ernie. I heard your music and uh, I would love to come and play with you. And Ernie was very wonderful because he then connected me with Lee Rittenauer and Don Grossin, and Polinio da Costa and uh, Herbie Mann. And, and, <laughs> and I got just from one person, I got connected to so many musicians and I worked with all of them. Uh, I think the very important thing is to remember, there's a, there's a chapter in my book that I must share the principle with all of you. The, the, I was once playing at a function, playing with a big star from Hong Kong, uh, Francis Yip. And uh, then there was another Filipino band playing some dance music after the function. So then after that, I went down and uh, with the guys and I, you know, we were going to eat at the coffee shop, the coffee house in the hotel. Then I saw the band comes in and then they and then they 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 ordered food and they didn't have to pay for the food. And then I, I went up to the FMB director after that and I said, hey, how come we have to pay for our own food? And why is it the, the other band can just eat for free? And this FMB director said to me, You don't ask, you don't get. And therefore, it's very important not to be afraid to ask for what you need in any relationship whether it's a couple relationship, whether it's a friend, whether it's a business relationship. Of course, you don't ask until people get fed up of you, but you know, when you need something, you should just ask for it, you know? And, uh, and so don't be afraid, uh, don't be shy when you go, when you see a musician that comes to Thailand, you know, if you want to take a lesson. For example, there was one festival that I was playing where I was kind of like, one of the not not the not the top headliners, but one of the people whose photo and name was on the on the on the on the festival poster, and then Dave Valentine was playing there, but then Bill O'Connell was in uh, Dave Valentine's band, right? And they, uh, I know that Bill O'Connell is an expert of playing the Montuno and the uh, and all the Latin jazz stuff, and I just went straight up to him. I said, "Hey, Bill, I love you playing," and. Uh, can I take a couple of lessons from you while we're here at this festival? And how much would you charge me? You know, and then he's he said, okay, uh, it's hundred dollars a lesson. Okay, I said, yeah, no problem. Then we, and then at the end of the first lesson, uh, you know, he's I, I wanted to pay him. He said, no, 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 it's okay. I had too much fun just hanging out with you, and you know, and then he gave me a second lesson, and and so the the answer to your question is very broadly. Uh, just don't be afraid and don't be shy to reach out to people. The most that people can say is no. And you have to prepare yourself for them to say no. But more than half the time, it won't be no. It will be yes. Yeah, sure, I'd like to play with you. Yeah, sure, I'll play on your 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 video track or your track of, uh, or, oh yeah, sure, I'll play on your album, you know. Uh, and and uh, just don't be afraid to do it. Thank you, Jeremy. Pi Hong, what to say, Mika? Can. Ah, P. Can. Ah, really, I'm. 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 I'm.
พวกสร้างงานสร้างกิ๊กที่จะติดต่อคนที่เราเป็นไอดอลอะไรของเราได้อย่างเขาก็ยกตัวอย่างว่าอย่างคนแรกๆที่เป็นดาราเป็นศิลปินแกรมมี่อะไรเนี่ยที่เขาร่วมงานด้วยก็คือเออร์นีวัตใช่ไหมครับที่เป็นมือเทนเนอร์แซกโซโฟนระดับโลกอย่างคุณมาร์กก็น่าจะรู้จักทุกคนน่าจะรู้จักอย่างนี้ครับเออร์นีวัตเขาก็อย่างแรกคือเขาก็โทรไปหาที่ที่ออฟฟิศที่เป็นที่เป็นผู้จัดการของทางทางคุณเอลนี่วัตนี่ครับแนนซี่ใช่ไหมครับแล้วก็พอโทรไปก็เนี่ยด้วยการคุยกันดีๆเนี่ยแล้วผู้จัดการก็ดิเรกให้โทรไปที่เอลนี่วัตโดยตรงเลยอะไรเงี้ยก็คุยด้วยกันครั้งแรกว่าจะขอเชิญมาเล่นที่สิงคโปร์หรือเชิญมาเล่นที่ไหนก็ตามเนี่ยก็อาจจะมีการคล้ายๆออดิชั่นนิดๆทุกคนอยากเอ้ยจะมีส่งคลาสเซ็ตสมัยสมัยสมัยนั้นเป็นการส่งเทปถูกไหมสมัยนี้เราส่ง MP3 ผลงานว่าการเล่นของเรามีซาวเป็นยังไงหรือวงที่เราเคยเล่นเนี่ยซาวเป็นยังไงเพื่อให้ศิลปินเขาได้ฟังก่อนว่าทิศทางเขาอยากจะร่วมเล่นด้วยประมาณไหนอะไรอย่างเงี้ยครับเป็นการเป็นการฟังกันคร่าวๆซึ่งพอฟังแล้วเนี่ยเจอร์มี่ก็ได้โทรศัพท์มาตอนตีสามเนี่ยว่ามาที่สมัยนั้นก็โทรศัพท์มาที่บ้านใช่ไหมครับว่าแบบโอเคอยากจะร่วมงานด้วยก็ถือว่าเป็นการติดต่อเบื้องต้นว่าแบบร่วมงานยังไงแล้วก็คุณเจอร์มี่ก็พูดถึงเครือข่ายว่าหลังจากที่เขาได้ร่วมงานกับเออร์นิวัตแล้วก็เป็นเพื่อนกันเนี่ยเขาก็รู้จักเขาก็สร้างเครือข่ายด้วยการแนะนํานักดนตรีคนอื่นอย่างนักดนตรีแจ๊สอย่างดอนกรูซินอย่างลีลิสนาวเนี่ยครับทุกอย่างเนี่ยมาจากเอ่อมาจากเครือข่ายมาจากเน็ตเวิร์กของตัวนี้ฉะนั้นแล้วเขาก็พูดอีกอย่างหนึ่งเรื่องของหลักการของเขาเป็นปริศนาพวกของเขาว่าถ้าคุณไม่ถามคุณก็จะไม่ได้อะไรอย่างเงี้ยคือก็อย่าง่ายๆคืออย่าอายที่จะถามอะไรเขาก็ยกตัวอย่างว่าเวลาเขาเล่นที่กับศิลปินเห็นอีกวงที่เป็นวงเฮาส์แบนทำไมถึงได้ทานข้าวฟรีอะไรเงี้ยผู้จัดการของโรงแรมก็บอกว่าถ้าก็ไม่ยอมถามเองนี่ถ้าถามก็ได้ทานฟรีอะไรเงี้ยนี่ยกตัวอย่างคร่าวๆนะครับหรือแม้กระทั่งเรื่องของเฟสติวัลเวลาเขาไปเล่นเนี่ยเขาก็ไม่ไม่อายที่จะถามมือเปียโนบิลโอคอนเนอร์ใช่ไหมโอคอนเนอร์ใช่ไหมครับสำหรับที่เป็นมือเปียโนของเดฟฟาลนทีเนี่ยมือฟลุตเนี่ยครับว่าไอ้พอเขาเล่นลาตินอะไรต่างๆเนี่ยเพื่อที่จะขอเรื่องของการเรียนเลสซันอะไรอย่างเงี้ยครับซึ่งซึ่งซึ่งก็เป็นอะไรที่ดีเหมือนกันถ้าเราถ้าเราไปเล่นที่ไหนเราไปเฟสติวัลอะไรเราก็สามารถที่จะไปถามศิลปินในดวงใจได้เลยว่าเ,เราอยากจะขอขอ,อ private lesson เลยด้วยซึ่งซึ่งไปมาก็เขาก็ไม่ชาร์จเงินเพราะว่าคุยกันสนุกอะไรอย่างเงี้ยครับยก,ยกตัวอย่างว่าเป็นลักษณะที่ถ้าเป็นนักดนตรีแล้วก็ควรที่จะเปิดใจในการที่อยากได้อะไรอยากจะขออะไรอยากจะร่วมงานกับใครที่เป็นไอดอลเราทั้งไทยและต่างชาติเนี่ยเราเรียกเอาเราเราสามารถที่จะติดต่อเขาไปได้เลยแน่นอนมันมีทั้งการตอบรับมาที่อยากจะร่วมงานด้วยกับไม่เราก็ต้องเตรียมใจไว้ทั้งสองด้านครับสั้นๆประมาณนี้ค่ะขอบคุณอาจารย์ฮงค่ะมีคําถามเพิ่มไหมคะมีฝั่งบิสเนสจะถามอะไรไหมคะมานั่งยิ้มอยู่เนี่ยอยากอยากได้คําถามจากฝั่งนักศึกษา M E B ด้วยเนาะหรือว่านักศึกษาใครก็ตามที่อยู่ในนี้มีมีอยู่เยอะเลยทำเลยครับเชิญเลยครับก็ผมผมมองเรื่องของการสร้างความหรือดึงดูดให้นักดนตรีระดับโลกมาครับก็คืออย่างถ้าเป็นนิวกรณีของนิวยอร์กเนี่ยก็จะเป็นที่ที่นักดนตรีระดับโลกเนี่ยไปฝันที่อยากจะไปเล่นหรือว่าชักชวนมาเล่นได้ง่ายใช่ไหมครับแต่ว่าถ้าในฝั่งของเซาท์อีสเอเชียเนี่ยคุณเจอร์มี่มีความคิดยังไงบ้างว่าแบบจะสร้างความดึงดูดให้แบบนักดนตรีระดับโลกเนี่ยเข้าเข้ามาเล่นที่แบบฝั่งเอเชียมากยิ่งขึ้นนะครับอะไรประมาณนี้ <laughs> งงไหมครับไม่งงค่ะไม่งงอ่าโอเคเจอร์มี่อ่า there's a a a business student ask about uh, the venue uh, here here he has the example about uh, New York New York is like a center of everything and uh, jazz uh, jazz is also uh, one of the things that uh, all uh, every every musician wants to go there and play at New York uh, so he asked that how what your idea about um, Making Asia being a center seems like New York for for musician, like uh, fa uh, um, most famous musician or or musician over around the world wants to come to Asia for playing. Yes, I mean that's a very uh, nice ambition, but the truth of the matter is that uh, using an analogy. 
of the Vatican. There's no way the the Pope will move the Vatican to uh, Jakarta, for example. You know, and the fact of the matter that is that uh, it, that New York is the center is the mecca of jazz today, and you know, so is to a certain degree the cradle of jazz of New Orleans and. Uh, and the other centers like Chicago and uh, Los Angeles. And it's not going to be easy for any city in the world to become New York. But that doesn't mean that it, we cannot create other centers of excellence of the music. Already, uh, Tokyo is a, a fantastic center of jazz. And um, before the Fukushima uh, uh, disaster, there were 50 jazz clubs in Tokyo alone, right? Now there's about 30, but still it's a great center of jazz in Asia. And in 1930s, the center of jazz was Shanghai, right? And, uh, and uh, so basically, and to be very honest, uh, to me, Bangkok is a huge center of jazz in Southeast Asia because of the sheer level of numbers of sheer numbers of great musicians who play at the international level in 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 Bangkok uh, yeah in Singapore and Malaysia we have two or three on each instrument that may be of international level maybe now more in Singapore more and more but in Bangkok it's like a, at least 10 great pianists 10 15 great guitarists many many uh, and I think I've talked about this before privately with Hong about how that uh, there's no question about the level of, I just saw this young guitar player who loves to play all the Pat Metini uh, from Thailand, right? All the Pat Metini uh, tunes on her guitar. Uh, uh, and, and, and just to look at the kind of level that's available there. And Indonesia, of course, they used to be very high level in fusion jazz and uh, also now growing more straight ahead jazz. Um, so how then we, do we make our cities or make the region a, a kind of a vortex or, or, or center of excellence for jazz? It, one is that really it's important um, to understand the business of language and commerce and the global language is English, you know, and as much as we may be. Uh, proud of our own language and of course we should be proud of our own language whether it's Malay or Indonesian or uh, we have to understand that if we want to interface in the world we have to develop a level of English that's high enough that we can uh, communicate across the world and speak uh, with other musicians uh, in a language that common language and common ground that they feel that they can part of it and um, of course when there was no COVID many musicians used to come over here and we used to go, some of us used to travel to Europe to play, to UK, to Europe or wherever. Uh, for me, not that much to the US, but I did travel and tour in the US in the past. But I found that, okay, uh, this kind of brings me to my recent chart success in America, uh, having had my latest album reach the top 50 of the um, Jazz Week charts. And actually get onto the top 20. And this is because I put the effort of hiring a team of three publicists, one radio publicist, sorry, two radio publicists, one to work the 65 stations of the Jazz Week affiliated stations, one to work on the other 450 stations within the uh, college radio stations and nonprofit radio stations. Another publicist handle more than 100 uh, written media magazines online and print. And then I also worked with a company called Play MPE who sent out, sent out my album to 2,600 jazz affiliated uh, magazines, DJs, station managers around the world. And, and it takes our effort, it takes money to hire these people. But I think it's very important to do this after you do the album, because if not, then you will never the album is only listened to your friends will listen to your album, right? So uh, 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 
the more of us that do this to get our music out there in the US, my album has been played now in the US more than 2,500 times across all the radio stations. The more we put this kind of effort in and the more that our music from here is listened to in the US, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, if we are not going to be visible and heard in the US for an art form that comes from the US, then we will not be able to raise our own personal profile globally and nor will we be able to do this thing that this gentleman who just asked me and also I want and all of us want, which is to make Southeast Asia uh, a, a center of jazz in the world that that will resonate and be, uh, you know, additional centers of jazz other than just New York. I think that's my my take on that question. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Ah, uh, ha. Uh, ตอบคำถามนะคะของของของเพื่อนที่ทำมานะคะก็คือเขาก็บอกเราว่าเอาเอาตรงตรงเลยคือเราก็คงไม่สามารถจะเป็นนิวยอร์กคือหรือไม่ใช่แค่เราอะค่ะไม่ว่าจะเป็นเมืองไหนก็ตามเนี่ยก็ไม่ไม่น่าจะเป็นเซ็นเตอร์ได้เหมือนที่นิวยอร์กคงทําไม่ได้ค่ะแต่ว่าไม่มันก็ไม่ได้แปลว่าเราจะเอ่อจะไม่สามารถเป็นเป็นเป็นอ่าตลาดที่ที่ใหญ่ประมาณหนึ่งหรือเป็นตลาดสําคัญของแจ๊สได้นะคะเขาก็มองว่าเอาจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยในโตเกียวเองเนี่ยก็เป็นเซ็นเตอร์ที่สําคัญเพราะว่าก่อนหน้าที่จะเป็นโควิดเนี้ยค่ะก็จะมีผับแจ๊สใน50 50ผับเป็นอย่างน้อยเนี่ยที่ในตัวเกียวอย่างเดียวในเมืองโตเกียวอย่างเดียวนะคะซึ่งตอนนี้ก็น่าจะเหลือแค่ประมาณ30นะคะก็ถือว่าถือว่าอย่างปี1930เนี่ยแจ๊สของของเอเชียก็ไปไปเซ็นเตอร์อยู่ที่เซี่ยงไฮ้ใช่ไหมชังไฮ้นี่คือเซี่ยงไฮ้เนาะเซี่ยงไฮ้อยู่นะคะก็คือจริงๆแล้วมันก็มันก็มันก็มีมีมีมีสิ่งเหล่านี้อยู่ในอยู่ในเอเชียอยู่หรือแม้แต่กระทั่งกรุงเทพเองเนี่ยจริงๆแล้วเขาเขาก็บอกว่าจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยกรุงเทพเนี่ยถือว่าเป็นเซ็นเตอร์หลักอันหนึ่งด้วยซ้ําของของแจ๊สในเอเชียนะคะเพราะว่าเขาก็บอกว่าในในบ้านเมืองในบ้านเราเนี่ยจริงๆแล้วก็มีนักดนตรีแจ๊สเก่งๆที่ที่มีกันหลายคนในหลายๆเครื่องที่ที่มากมายแล้วเราก็จะเห็นแบบแล้วก็มีเฟสติวัลนู้นนั่นนี่ก็จริงๆแล้วถือว่ากรุงเทพเองก็เป็นเซ็นเตอร์อันหนึ่งนะะแต่ทีนี้เนี่ยเขาบอกว่าถ้าเราจะจะอัพเลเวลของเราอะให้ให้ไปอยู่ในโพสิชันที่เราอยากได้เนี่ยอันดับแรกเลยที่เราต้องคอนเซิร์นก็คือว่าเรื่องภาษานะคะก็คือว่าในในเอเชียของเราเองเนี่ยเราจะมีความภาคภูมิใจเกี่ยวกับภาษาของเราไม่ว่าจะเป็นบ้านเราเองหรือเอ,เอหรือมาเลเซียนะคะหรือแม้แต่ญี่ปุ่นเองอย่างเงี้ยเขาก็เราก็จะมีความภูมิใจในภาษาบ้านของเราแต่ในขณะที่ถ้าเราจะโกโกโบเนี่ยหรือจะไปในระดับโลกเนี่ยภาษาทั่วไปหรือภาษากลางที่ที่เขาทราบหรือเขารู้ก็เป็นภาษาอังกฤษซึ่งภาษาอังกฤษเนี่ยเราเราจะต้องเราต้องมีการอะดัปตัวหรือว่าพัฒนาตัวเองให้ไปอยู่ในเลเวลที่สามารถสื่อสารในสเกลของ g l o b a l ได้นะคะไม่ไม่ไม่ใช่แค่ในเรื่องการสื่อสารให้เข้าใจแต่จะต้องเหมือนเข้าใจในเซนส์หรือเข้าใจในในบริบทต่างๆอื่นๆของในแบบที่ที่ฝรั่งเขาคุยกันอันนี้ก็เป็นเป็นสิ่งหนึ่งที่ที่อาจจะทำมันอาจจะยกระดับเลเวลในการที่เราจะเราจะสามารถไปในระดับทั่วโลกหรือว่า g l o b a l ก็ g l o b a l ได้นะคะอีกอย่างที่ที่เจอร์มี่บอกก็คือว่าเขาก็ยกตัวอย่างตัวเขาเองที่ที่เอาตัวเองเข้าไปอยู่ในแจ๊สชาร์จของ <coughs> ขอโทษค่ะของ US ได้อย่างเงี้ยค่ะเขาก็เล่าให้ฟังว่าเขาใช้วิธีจ้างเขาทำงานหรือว่าจ้างหรือใช้เงินไปกับการลงทุนในการที่จะทำงานกับคนที่รู้จักสื่อหรือถือสื่อทางของอเมริกาอยู่ในมือไม่ว่าจะเป็นแมกกาซีนหรือว่าคนที่เคยทำโปรโมตต่างๆให้กับสื่อต่างๆในในในอเมริกานะคะถามว่าเขาเสียงเงินไปเยอะไหมเขาเสียงเงินไปเยอะก็ตรงนี้แต่เขาก็บอกว่าถ้าถ้าเขาไม่ทำแบบนี้เนี่ยเราไม่มีทางที่จะทําให้เราเราจะต้องการที่เราจะทําให้คนอื่นรู้จักในในเลเวลของระดับโลกได้เนี่ยมันก็ต้องทําให้คนอเมริกันรู้จักเขาเพราะว่าการที่คนอเมริกันรู้จักเขาก็คือมันก็จะรู้จักไปทั่วโลกแต่ถ้าเกิดเขาไม่สามารถทําตัวเองให้ไปอยู่ในเลเวลนั้นได้เนี่ยมันก็ยากที่ที่จะเอาเอาเอาตัวเราเนี่ยไปบอกว่าให้คนอื่นทั่วทั่วโลกรู้จักเราอย่างเงี้ยค่ะประมาณนี้ขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณคําถามครับขอบคุณอาจารย์น้องด้วยที่ช่วยแปลละเอียดเลยครับมีคําถามอะไรเพิ่มเติมไหมครับเรามีกันอีกประมาณ15นาที I think Julian Julian turn everyone see you turn on the microphone oh I didn't know I was I thought I was slick um I wanted
versus entertainment, especially as it kind of relates to jazz in this day in this day and age. I think one thing that we've really seen in this uh, pandemic situation is that a lot of people are turning to entertainment in a very specific way. A lot of things are very short. A lot of things are very, I would say, easy to wrap your ears around. And I know sometimes like those very two elements don't exactly fit into what we do. Sometimes, sometimes it's not very short and sometimes the language that we play can be a little bit, you know, it's not as simple as, as other things that people might be into. So if you could talk about uh, trying to find a balance as jazz musicians uh, in an era where entertainment is changing so rapidly, that'd be great. Sure. So two of my best friends were, uh, well, at least one of them was my best friend and one of them is a, is a friend that I, 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 I really, really respect said two completely um, seemingly incongruous statements. Uh, my, my good friend LD Young, who was the bass player, played in Bangkok for uh, seven, eight years before his passing. Uh, uh, he, LD Young, basically LD Young was is one of the great bass players of the world. He was the original bass player of the Ramsey Lewis trio. And, uh, and, 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 and and he he was uh, he was not just my best friend but a great mentor. Then on the other hand, having had a chance to both play uh, with Michael Brecker, not in a jazz but a pop situation, as well as open for the Brecker Brothers on another occasion, um, Michael Brecker said two separately things. So LD Young said, "If you don't play and make the people happy and entertain them, then you, then you're then it's." then it's you're not doing your job. Now, Michael Brecker said, art is not entertainment. Now, who's, who's telling the truth? And I can tell you ser seriously that the truth is somewhere in between both statements and not a fixed point between both, both statements, but a point that moves depending on what is required at a particular time. I think it's very important to realize that as a musician or as an artist, there's actually a higher position that you take that most artists and musicians don't really recognize in the beginning. And that is what you are, is a communicator. And how you use your art or craft to communicate is very important. Now, some people will take a high level of musicianship and juxtapose that with a personality that's jovial and funny and he may tell really funny stories in between the songs but when he actually plays the songs it's dead serious and really legit stuff right then there's people who will kind of like just play very entertaining fun stuff easy to listen and they're reaching a different maybe a larger audience and you know, I stopped judging really who's more legit because at the end of the day, I think that some artists take themselves as seriously as a heart attack and that's also not the right approach to take. And at the same time, there are those who, who just is always pandering to audience and always, uh, and I have to be very honest, I do both. So for example, I have a Christmas concert that I play every year. And it's not really for the jazz jazz fans. In fact, a lot of jazz aficionados have stopped coming to my Christmas concert because the stuff is not deep enough. But what happens is that I get 15, 60, 100 people who come and have a great time. And my mission statement for my Christmas concert is so that people will leave the, leave the audience with a smile on their face and a glow in their hearts. And that's my mission statement. So maybe that's not art, but people do feel that then i will do one for myself like this concert on september 18 is there's no entertainment at all i'm going to be playing standards in a trio format that i love so much that i've had success with uh, on the on the radio charts i'm going to play some tunes i'm practicing three four hours a day i'm you know it's going to be I'll, yeah i sure I, i'll still banter with the audience in between tunes but not so much and i won't really play super crowd pleasing things although if i want to play like Keith Jarrett will play a beautiful version of um, uh, Danny Boy or, or or somewhere over the rainbow, and it's 
it's it reaches both sides of the aisle, right? The people who love melodicism and, and the people who love depth and the spirituality that comes out of great music like that. So to me, I think part of it, one has to be careful because part of this so-called well, they say in America, the highfalutin art, right? Part, part of, of, of that, it comes from a sense of self-importance, which is not good and not healthy. Some of it's very, very sincere, you know, people really being sincere. I mean, like you see like Bill Evans, he's like crouched on his piano and just playing like that, you know, and then just, and, and, and just not caring about the people. It's beautiful, it's, it is art right and people like to listen to him like that but oscar peterson right i mean he's playing and he's all his artistry and he or count basie right he turns and he gives a big grin to the audience so that's entertaining to me you know what i mean so i guess it all boils down to one thing sincerity right what you feel and how you want to portray yourself how you want to use the tools and skills that you have how well you want to communicate to the people and uh and 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 then when you do that consciously and not do it i have a friend i won't mention his name i play with him great saxophone player he tried to do a fusion record right and it was so insincere and you know and he even said to me i'm just doing it for a payday you know people can feel it but then on the other hand you you, you listen to west montgomery playing pop and it's amazing because he means it, you know, and he's sincere about what he's trying to do. So the key thing, the long, the long and the short of this is just be sincere and just be truthful and then try, try to operate with integrity. And finally, don't forget, you can call yourself a musician, you can call yourself a painter, whatever you want to call yourself. End of the day, you are a communicator. Thanks, Julian. Thank that was a beautiful question. Thank you. ก็สะบิดฟอร์เอนเซอร์ครับคุณครับเจอร์มี่ครับคุณคําถามของจูเลนเอ่อเอาสั้นๆเนาะขอคําถามของจูเลนเกี่ยวกับเรื่องของไอ
ขอบคุณครับนั้นเราน่าจะเหลือคำถามอีกพักประมาณ maybe we have time for one last question Jeremy sure. before we wrap things up um, sure. who would be a lucky person to ask a last question <laughs> ใครถามดีคำถามสุดท้ายครับคำถามสุดท้ายมาเปิดกล้องอถามไหมกล้องก็จะโดนผมเหรอครับแล้วแต่ครับใครใครก็ได้เจนก็ได้เจนก็ได้ขอผู้หญิงถามสักคนเจนเปิดกล้องมาถามเลยถามไปในข้อความแล้วค่ะที่พี่องค์ถามแล้วอ๋อเจนถามแล้วขอโทษครับเจนถามแล้วนั้นเชิญมาร์กเลยครับเชิญมาร์กเลยครับอ่าอันนี้ขออนุญาตเป็นภาษาไทยแล้วกันนะครับอ่าอยู่เล่นมองโนมาอ๋อ <laughs> ได้ครับเป็นเดี๋ยวจะเป็นเป็นภาษาจีนก็ได้ครับ <laughs> โอเคครับอ่าผมผมอยากถามว่าอ่าเหมือนเหมือนเหมือนน่าจะมีคนถามไปก่อนหน้านี้แล้วคือว่าอ่าในในในแผนแผนการการซ้อมการทํางานในแต่ละวันของเขาอะครับแล้วก็เหมือนคราวนี้ผมผมอยากเจาะลึกไปไปในในเชิงของคอมโพสิชันนะครับว่าว่าอ่าอย่างอย่างคุณเจอร์มี่เริ่มเริ่มจากไอเดียแบบไหนบ้างแบบพอสังเขปก็ได้ครับหมายถึงว่าโครงสร้างของการจะคอมโพสิชันเพลงสักเพลงหนึ่งอะไรเงี้ยครับเอ่อ Would you like to translate Julian into English? Sure. What Mark just asked. Yes, absolutely. So, what Mark essentially asked, uh, he said, "You know, you he knows you may have mentioned it briefly before, but about your daily practice habits. But he wants to go a little bit deeper and ask about your compositional habits and kind of how you um, how you include different kinds of exercises and different little." Um, Different pieces of material to help grow your compositions, and if you have any examples of, um, I guess, kind of working backwards from a song and what your composition process is like specifically. Sure, I think uh, the most important thing about composing, maybe even much more than practicing or playing when I'm in my music room, is the ability to completely still my mind for long enough to allow. Inspiration to enter the room. I think that the ability to not succumb to distractions, whether it's the phone or uh, anything else, and switch everything off and have that kind of complete silence. So my belief is that silence is the wellspring of inspiration. And uh, the other thing is to make an appointment with inspiration. So very often. I would get into the room. I would say, "Okay, I'm going to write. I'm going to spend some time trying to write something at a given time." And I'll go in my music room. I'll lock the door, and I'll just do a little, not really practicing, you know, kind of like say, "Okay, I'm here, uh, Mister Inspiration or Miss Inspiration," and um, and you just wait for inspiration to show up, and you just do a little. And sometimes inspiration comes, and sometimes inspiration doesn't come. And、it's important that when you've made this appointment, whether you feel like doing it or you don't feel like doing it, you show up.、Um, you know, I think to be an artist, you have to whether you're in the mood or not in the mood to practice or in the mood and or not in the mood to write, you have to show up and try and do it anyway. And、uh, if you allow yourself to be very quiet for a certain amount of time, ideas will start to come to you. The very famous songwriter Roger Whittaker. I don't know how many of you know who he is. He wrote lots of great.、Uh, Folk tunes used to say that composers are like antenna, you know,、um, like satellite dish, and basically that all these sounds are floating in the air, and we have the ability as composers to receive these little snatches of of fragments that are in the ether, and and the, then try to put them together in some kind of cogent manner. So that's one approach、uh, that I. Partially subscribe to, and sometimes I will compose in a very funny way. Like I don't know, some of you may remember my tune "Brothers."、Uh, some of you have, who, have, who have had a chance to play for,、um, I wrote the song "Driving Home from a Gig Late at Night, One O'clock in the Morning," and and in in the in the drive home, I started to hear the whole tune, like I was listening to it on the radio, even though my radio wasn't on. 
and that's kind of creepy but then you go home and then you know you kind of you sit at the piano and then you quickly just put turn on the recorder this is in 1980s so no phone i used i had a little dictaphone and i quickly just recorded the the form of the song then next morning i would you know develop it another time i have to sit down i have to construct eight bars and then okay then nothing comes so i think this the 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 answer to mark's question is you have to to number one be, be able to create a atmosphere of silence and stillness for yourself because then only can you listen to the voice of inspiration since the voice of inspiration is silence and then the second thing is uh to to make these appointments i i i went to visit pat bettini's office in uh boston in, in cambridge one time and then i when i had a chance to hang out with him uh, in uh, Yokohama, I played the Mount Fuji Festival, and we actually rode to Narita Airport together. So I had two and a half hours with him, and 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 he said that every single morning, without fail, he would practice and then he would write. And he, he sometimes he wrote things that he liked, sometimes he wrote things that he hated, but he would record everything or scratch everything, and he would file it away either on the manuscript or on uh, on 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 uh, cassettes at that time and i talked when i spoke to him it was still 1996 so still people still using cassettes and uh um and then he would just every single day so th that th can you imagine that if he made an appointment with inspiration every single day i don't think i have that kind of discipline or i have had that kind of discipline but i i do dedicate the sounds to do that now the other thing about compositions as a jazz musician you got to remember that two kinds of compositions one is songs so songs is like rogers and hart tunes or gershwin tunes the other type of composition is themes themes is like c jam blues or take the a train it's not a song it's a theme and so Many modern compositions, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, many modern compositions, they don't really have a melody, it's just a groove, and then, you know, a couple of thematic snatches, and then great blowing over it. So you got to decide for yourself. I, I, I subscribe to all, I subscribe to all different types of aesthetics. So I will sometimes write a song, like recently I wrote a song called Josefina, it's a real melodic song. I wrote another song as a tribute to James Moody because we spent time working on, he, he was practicing in front of me and he basically used to love to uh, invert John Coltrane licks <laughs> as a hobby. And, uh, and, uh, and, and um, uh, so then you can do, uh, Michael Brecker called them sound shapes. He would create a sound shape and then join this sound shape with another sound shape. And then he would link and that was one style of composition. So whatever approach that you, th you take, I think it's important to to always remember that melody is king, and that uh, that while we may write songs that may not have strong melodies, to me, I think I still default to whether it's a song or whether it's a solo has to have a real strong melodic melodicism about it. Yeah, this can be one whole lecture by itself. So I think I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. ขออนุญาตแปลสั้นๆเนาะก่อนก่อนที่จะจบเรื่องของตัวออนไลน์เลคเชอร์วันนี้จริงๆในในส่วนของคําถามของคุณมาร์กนะครับในส่วนเรื่องของทํายังไงเรื่องของการแต่งเพลงอะไรอย่างนี้กับคุณอาจารย์จูเลียนที่แปลเป็นภาษาอังกฤษให้นะครับจริงๆคุณเจอร์มี่ก็จริงๆเขาบอกว่าคร่าวๆสองอย่างคือเรื่องของการสร้างสถานการณ์หรือว่าบรรยากาศสิ่งแวดล้อมให้มันเหมาะสมกับการที่จะสร้างตัวแรงบันดาลใจและที่2ก็คือเขาพูดเป็นลักษณะอุปมาอุปไมยว่าทําการนัดหมายกับเรื่องของแรงบันดาลใจนั้นๆเนี่ยไม่ว่าจะเป็นแรงบันดาลใจทางด้านไหนก็ตามเนี่ยซึ่งถ้าเขาเราเอา2อ,อย่างนี้เข้ามาประจวบเหมาะกันในการสร้างบรรยากาศเนี่ยทําให้มันมีอะไรที่เป็นเงียบที่สุดทําให้บางทีเรื่องของ distraction ในเรื่องของโทรศัพท์เรื่องของอินเทอร์เน็ตอะไรบางอย่างมันจะทําให้อพอเขาบอกว่าตัวตัวพวกนี้เนี่ยมันจะเป็นอะไรที่ถ,ถ้ายิ่งเงียบเนี่ยมันจะไอตัวแรงบันดาลใจมันก็จะมาเราเรื่องของสิ่งที่มันกวนใจเราหรือว่าเทคโนโลยีต่างๆบางทีเราปิดไปได้ไป,ไ,ปไ,ปไ,ปไปได้ก็ดีนะครับแล้วก็พูดถึงเรื่องของการการแต่งเพลงบางอย่างในเรื่องเขาเขาก็ยกตัวอย่างอย่างอันนี้เป็นสิ่งที่ดีมากเขาก็ยกตัวอย่างว่า
โรเจอร์วิทเทเกอร์ใช่ไหมครับที่เป็นนักแต่งเพลงที่โฟล์กเนี่ยที่มีชื่อเสียงมากๆก็ยกตัวอย่างว่าการแต่งเพลงมันเป็นลักษณะเหมือนคล้ายๆเสาอากาศอย่างเงี้ยครับมันมีข้อมูลอยู่ในอากาศมันเป็นหน้าที่ของเราที่จะหยิบข้อมูลบางอย่างเข้ามารวบรวมอันให้มันเป็นอะไรที่เป็นอะไรที่เป็นเป็นลักษณะเป็นเพลงอะไรต่างๆก็ถือว่าเป็นคําเปรียบเทียบที่ค่อนค่อนข้างดีหรือแม้กระทั่งยกตัวอย่างกรณีของมือกีตาร์ซึ่งเพิ่งฉลองวันเกิดไปไม่นานเนี่ยและเป็นไอดอลของมือกีตาร์หลายๆคนอย่างแพทเมอร์ฟินี่นะครับก็เขาก็เจอที่ไปออฟฟิศที่บอสตันหรือไปที่นาริตาแอร์พอร์ตใช่ไหมครับที่ญี่ปุ่นแล้วก็เป็นอะไรที่มีอยู่ด้วยกัน2ชั่วโมงเขาก็พูดจาเรื่องของคุยกันทั้งเจอร์มี่กับคุณแพทเมอร์ฟินี่ว่าคุยกันเรื่องของวิธีการในการแต่งเพลงหรือว่าชีวิตของเขาแพทเมอร์ฟินี่ก็บอกว่าใน,ในช่วงนั้นเนี่ยอาจจะเป็น20กว่าปีก่อนนะเขาก็ซ้อมทุกเช้าทุกเช้าเขาก็จะอัดเขาก็พยายามที่จะแต่งเพลงทุกเช้าด้วยหลังจากซ้อมนะครับก็เป็นถือว่าเป็นการสร้างแฮปปี้ที่ดีลักษณะที่ใส่นิสัยที่ดีไม่ว่าจะเป็นแต่งเพลงอะไรที่ดีหรือไม่ดีก็ตามก็พยายามจะฝึกทุกวันมันทําให้เรื่องของแล้วก็พยายามอัดตัวเองไว้ในการทั้งซ้อมแล้วก็ในเรื่องของเพลงที่เขาแต่งอะไรอย่างเงี้ยครับก็เป็นสิ่งอีกอย่างหนึ่งที่ดีแล้วก็เขาก็พูดถึงเรื่องของตัวท้ายที่สุดเขาเขาเน้นไว้ว่ามันมี2รูปแบบของอการประพันธ์เพลงใช่ไหมครับรูปแบบที่เรียกว่าเป็นเพลงเป็นทูนเป็นซองใช่ไหมครับกับรูปแบบที่เป็นที่เป็นฟิล์มก็คือเป็นคำว่าเป็นฟิล์มก็คือเป็นแค่ประโยคสั้นๆ4บาร์เขาก็ยกตัวอย่างอย่างฟิล์มก็นักดนตรีแจ๊สรู้จักกับซีแจมส์บลูหรือว่าเทคเดียเทรนถูกไหมครับคำว่าเป็นเพลงก็เป็นเพลงที่เป็นมีมีโครงสร้างอะไรต่างๆเนี่ยไม่ว่าจะเป็น2ประเภทนี้ประเภทไหนก็ตามเนี่ยมันทุกอย่างมันดีหมดแหละอยู่ที่ว่าเราจะแต่งเพลงอย่างไงแล้วเขาก็ทิ้งไทยไปว่าจริงๆแล้วสิ่งที่สำคัญที่สุดก็คือเรื่องของเมโลดี้เขาก็บอกว่าเป็นเมโลดี้สกิงใช่ไหมครับก็คือทุกอย่างเมโลดี้มันเป็นหัวใจสําคัญมันเป็นสิ่งที่อยู่สอยู่สูงสุดทุกทุกทุกเพลงจะต้องมีอะไรประมาณนี้ในสิ่งที่เขาที่เขาทิ้งท้ายไว้ and I like to also add Jeremy you have also um, your book your composition book um, yes. released like several years ago yes I have and uh, in fact I I will share the the link to download the book uh, so uh, to with you separately and please ask your students to freely uh, I I think there's some copies hard copy left in the uh, in Slapcon but I actually I'm not interested to Make money on this book. I just want people to discover my compositions. So I, you know, I will send a link as well for those who want to download the whole book. Yeah. Well, thank you very much in advance. That's very generous of you. Um, I think we have time. That that's pretty much time we have for this um, online lecture. Uh, thanks again, Jeremy, um, for um, you know um, participating in this online workshop. Thank you very much and. Oh, I, I want to ask a small favor if I can take a photo of all of us uh, on the group. Uh, if they can, those yeah, who are, are willing maybe, to switch on their their cameras, so we can take a photo together. We can, we can do the snapshot. Um, yeah, I can do the snapshot. Uh, uh, open, 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 มีแบ็กกราวด้วยสวยงามนอปิตา Thank you Thank you so much I'm gonna take uh, two photos uh, one is of of this screen first uh, mm -hmm. a smile okay then uh, one more of the uh, to of second screen I see the second screen a lot of people don't want to put their cameras on but uh, it's okay <laughs> <laughs> really okay okay all right Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks for having me. It was such a pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.